Marriage. Marriage is what brings us together today. <laughs> All right, enough silliness. Seriously, though, marriage is the issue that brings us together. The question we're talking about right now is, does the Bible really teach us that wives should submit to their husbands? This is um, not exactly clear enough for today. That question of should wives submit to their husbands, that's not clear enough to delineate the massive debate that goes on on this very topic. So while I try to shed some light on the subject, I, uh, I just happened to forget to turn my light on. So I thought I'd good transition there, huh? Except that when you talk about your good transition, it doesn't. All right, so uh, does the Bible really teach? Here's the question I want to target for today. Does the Bible really teach that there's an authority imbalance in the marriage relationship between husbands and wives and that the husband is the one who has that greater authority? That's a very clear way of putting the term. So the alternative view, that's the traditional view. That's what most Christians have held throughout time. But the alternative view is that egalitarians are correct and not all egalitarians believe this, but a large, large number do. And I would argue that their views, if you hold their views consistently, then you believe this thing about marriage. Their argument would be that perhaps we've all misunderstood the meaning of the Greek words in some of these verses that we use to support um, a husband having a higher authority. Perhaps, point two, perhaps we fail to notice when Paul is just talking about a culturally bound and time bound compromise of having wives submit instead of saying that it was God's timeless command. So God doesn't want it for all time. It was really just for a special moment, and an informed person will recognize that. And number three, Galatians will also say that perhaps we've misunderstood the context of those passages, and it really isn't even saying at all for women to submit. Really, it's saying that everyone should submit mutually, husbands and wives submit to each other, so that the result is, and this is the important part, there's no authority imbalance in marriage. So what do I mean? First, let me explain this, right? My name is Mike Winger. This is the Women in Ministry series. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. But first, before anything else, I have to clear the air on this one issue. When I say submission, I don't, there's certain things I mean, and there's certain things I don't mean by that phrase. So let me clarify, because this is going to frame for us everything else I say for the rest of the video. And I realized if you have a different, you know, interpretation of the word submit than I do, you're going to be hearing me wrong and you'll probably get mad at me. So let me, let me say this. Submission does not mean, it does not mean, one, that the wife follows the micromanagement instructions of the husband. You do this, put those shoes on, don't walk that way, don't talk like that. It's not that. Okay, That's not what I think submission means. Number two, it doesn't mean that the wife cannot make decisions. Right? This doesn't rule out all decision making for the wife, like she's a permanent like three-year-old. It also does not mean that she has no authority over the home or the children, the kids. She has real authority in her home and real authority over the children. It also does not mean, submission does not mean, that she has no independent control over her business, job, or personal pursuits. Right? I do not think submission means that. Well, the reason why I have to say this is because a lot of egalitarians will interpret submit to mean all of those things. And so, you know, me saying a wife should submit, they inter they go, oh, you think she has, she gets micromanaged, she can't make decisions, she has no authority over the home or kids, she has no authority over herself, she can't make independent decisions over her business, job, or personal pursuits. Or the last one, she can't make reasonable demands on her husband. Ah, I think a wife can make reasonable demands on her husband. Here's what I do mean by submit. So I don't mean any of those things. But when I say submit, what I mean is that supporting, not just believing, catch this, men and women, wives especially, this is what I think it means. If it's true, supporting, not just believing that the husband has the ability to make decisions for the household. Not doesn't mean he makes them completely alone, but he has that ability to make that, be that sort of deciding vote. Um, supporting also, second thing I'd say, means supporting, not just believing that the husband is in a headship role in relation to his wife, like a head and body relationship with the wife. And so I talked about that last week in last week's video. Um, so first, let me say this. This is going to be a long video. We're going to put timestamps down below after the video is over to help you navigate exactly this intro. I'm just going to explain. Here's what it's about. Like, this is what I'm going to be talking about in today's video. This is what you're going to get in the next few minutes. Then I'm going to dig deep into it. I'll move as fast as I can without hopefully losing anybody along the way because it's going to be very in-depth. We're going to dig into a lot of things. So 
First, I want to offer a defense for why I'm covering the topic of men and women in their marriage relationships on a series where I'm going through what the Bible teaches about women in ministry, right? That's not ministry, Mike, right? Marriage isn't ministry, at least not when we classically think of ministry in churches. So one, the issues are connected. Wherever, I think logically, wherever you go on the topic of women in ministry, um, eldership, is where you are probably going to go on the topic of marriage. If you think women can be ordained as elders and that's and there's no difference that we need to worry about with re regarding authority in the church, you're going to probably, not always, probably say the same thing in the home. There are some people who will hold that women, you know, can be ordained into any position in the church, but that there is an authority imbalance in home, but they're the minority. And number two, the second reason why I would say this is scripture seems to co connect the two very strongly that the the issues of women in ministry are connected to the issues of men and women in marriage and because they're interconnected in scripture i would not be doing scripture justice if i don't also deal with the marriage issue when i do this series i'm not going to ignore that bit of scripture that does that and number three this is such a huge issue um, this is a bigger deal than women as elders or pastors or anything else. It's a more significant issue because it impacts the, the, the marriage of every Christian, not just whoever happens to be in leadership over your church, which your marriage is a bigger deal than who your pastor is, right? Like whether they're male or female, that's secondary to the nature of the interaction between you and your spouse. Um, and that it's healthy and godly and biblically and biblical. And we'll talk about what that means in this video. The egalitarian view of marriage, that there's no higher authority in the husband, is quickly gaining popularity as well. It's very, very quickly gaining popularity for obvious reasons. I mean, it's incredibly popular culturally. Okay, the egalitarians, I'm not saying you're therefore wrong. I'm just saying that um, your views would not be gaining gaining ground like they are if not for the cultural setting we're in, right? The, the cultural setting is, is why it's wildfire you know, gaining views. It's very palatable specifically to first world westernized countries. And when I say it's gaining in popularity, I do not mean in the majority of the world. I mean only in the minority first world westernized countries. That seems to be where this 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 egalitarian view of marriage, not just ministry, is really quickly gaining in popularity. When you go to most of the world, this is, I think, not the case as far as I can tell, right? They have a more traditional view of marriage. So here we go. This is part nine in the, check out my graphics, Women in Ministry series. <laughs> Such skills. There's a link below that you can go and check out the entire series if you would like to. And you can just look at how thorough this is. This is a very in-depth series. At the end of it all, I will give one video that's just a quick overview where I'm, I don't build my case. I just draw the conclusions. Just boom, 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 boom. I know people will be interested in that. Um, and the notes are also going to be available. I will have my notes after the stream. I'll have a chance to, to put them in the video description. You guys are welcome to look at my notes. The reason why I mention that is because in my notes, I have footnotes to where I'm getting all these quotes from. I'm going to share quotes from dozens of different sources. And I will have uh, footnotes and details there so you can track those things down. Because that's one thing I do in my research is I check people's footnotes. I don't just take their word for it. Perfectly expect you to do the same to me. So now here's the plan. Here's the agenda for today's video. Step one, I'm going to do a quick overview of the teaching of the most relevant passages that deal with marriage, husband and wife relationships. At least from my own perspective, these are the, the three chief passages. It's 1 Peter 3, Colossians 3, Ephesians 5. Then there's two like supplemental passages. I'll quickly talk about those. 1 Timothy 2, 5, 1 Corinthians 7. Three, verses three through five. I'm just going to draw out the major points and lay out the conclusions. This will feel like a normal, like this is how Christians have kind of always been thinking about this stuff. This will feel like a pretty typical complementarian perspective, but it is the one that I think is accurate. I have spent a lot of time working on this, but that will not be done there. That's just to, to get the, the issues out on the table and say, hey, here's one view. The entire rest of the time in the majority of this video, we will be spending dealing with egalitarian pushback and alternate interpretations of all of those verses. So I just want you to see this is how I do understand these verses, but the entire rest of the video is dealing with only those who disagree with me and why, this is the important part, why they disagree. We will deal with, on each of the three main passages, we'll deal with different scholars and how they disagree. We'll even be dealing with what's called the slavery objection, which is the idea that, hey, fine, Mike, if you want to say that wives have a role of 
lower authority in the marriage than the husband. They still have authority, but it's a different authority, a lesser authority, even though they're equal in person. If you're going to say that, if that's your claim, then you have to support slavery throughout time in every culture. That is the slavery objection. We'll be dealing with that too. That comes towards the end. And again, we'll put timestamps down below. So here's hoping, praying that I'll have the energy coffee, to get through all this really well in a way that's informative for you, helps you think biblically about everything and be fully exposed to both sides. Uh, at least I believe that'll be the case. So here we go. Starting with the first passage, this is my teaching through the book of 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. I'll move fairly quickly so we can spend most of our time in dealing with all the people that would think that I'm wrong about this. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of the hair and putting on of gold, jewelry, or the clothing you wear, but, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their, their own husbands, excuse me, let me find my spot here, by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Then it has a word for husbands. We'll get to that in just a moment. So what are we, what are we getting here? I'll be leaving this, this, most of this up for you guys to look at. Um, wives are to what? To be subject. And that, that, that's a Greek word, be subject there. This is, just so you know, for those who are like, Mike, you're, you're using the ESV, aren't you? I know that that's like, that's like a translation just made to support man's powers. Um, that's a false claim. <laughs> but but here's, a, here's a more important issue that relates to this particular study. At no point am I quoting the ESV in a way that reads differently than the vast majority of all translations, right? There's no, there's no, at no point in my entire women in ministry series am I leaning on the ESV and the way they translate as being my case for anything. So you could read this, uh, here it says be subject to other translations, even things like the RSV, which, which would be the old RSV, which would lean more um, liberal in, in those types of readings, is going to say the same basic thing. So don't get distracted is what I'm saying. These are, those are irrelevant issues. First uh, Peter chapter three, verses, verse one, it says wives should be subject to their own husbands. Uh, that word hupotasso, this is a Greek word that definitely means being in submission to. It means that somebody else is, 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 has a higher authority than you. That's the nature of the term. That's its usage very consistently over and over again. Okay, so that, that's important. But the reasons for why a wife should be subject to her own husband, according to 1 Peter, is, let's list them now. Okay, I read the passage, I'll just list them. One is that they might get saved, right? That for, the, for those husbands that aren't saved, they might get saved. Because they'll see the conduct of the wife and, and be drawn towards Christianity. I mean, Lee, Lee Strobel, his testimony is a lot like this. He talks about how his wife got saved and he was really bothered by it. And he wanted to draw her out of Christianity. He didn't like it. But her attitude and her joy and, her, and the goodness that he saw in her, that, that had an impact on him, you know? So this is a good thing. Um, so it's, it's not exclusive, though. This is super important to recognize for later on. It's not like the only reason wives should be subject is for their husbands to get saved, as if it's only instruction to wives who have unsaved husbands. Rather, it's just one of the benefits if some do not obey the word. So, hey, all wives be subject, but if some of them aren't obeying the word, that'll be harder for you. That'll be make your, your yielding to your husband more difficult, but it might be evangelism to him. So that could be a positive thing. It's not, in other words, and I'll say this, it's not just convenient or culturally acceptable here it's not just for evangelism purposes, although that's one of the secondary reasons. It is because it's good. It's respectful and pure conduct, which implies that this is just something that's generally a positive thing to see in a person. Let's read on. Verse 3 um, through 7 has some very interesting stuff that seems to reinforce this as well. First Peter, this is why in all the egalitarian debate stuff, I was much more open to the idea of um, changing my mind on the the um, 
the eldership role and deacon role and things like that, which I did change my mind on the deacon role. But I, I, I thought I'd have a harder time changing my mind on the topic of marriage because these passages seem so abundantly clear to me. But we will get into all the pushback. And um, I was willing to change my mind. I just thought it would, it seemed like, I don't, I don't know where the wiggle room is. I kind of wanted to change my mind, but I didn't know, I don't know where the wiggle room is. I was, would be surprised if someone came up with good arguments against this stuff. We will deal with the best arguments I've found though today. So he says, don't let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart. Okay, so he's talking about, hey, have godly character with the imperishable, be imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. These phrases are implying that this is this is not just a convenience thing. This is this is just character thing. Women, you know, wives submit to your husbands and don't worry just about external things, but have this godliness in your heart. And he's still talking about submission, right? Because as he goes on to verse five, he completely talks about Sarah as an example of submission. So the whole category has to do with that topic. I know this is super unpopular in our modern culture. This is why I clarify what I meant by submission, that I didn't mean a bunch of things because I already know people are like, do not recommend videos from this channel, <laughs> which is fine. You can do what you want, man. Uh, you don't need to watch my videos and I don't need you to watch my videos. But um, but but yeah, I mean, maybe you need to understand scripture better. Maybe that maybe that's there. Just don't turn off the Bible, uh, even if you turn me off. But yeah, it's not just convenient. It's not just for a submission po submissive posture so that it would be culturally acceptable. It's just something that is classically been done by godly women throughout time, according to First Peter. Then it says this that this is something that is very precious in God's sight. This gentle and quiet spirit having to do with submission and godliness. It's something that God sees as very precious. God, see, our culture sees submission as a um, shocking, weak, offensive thing. If a woman's like, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask my husband about that. If a woman says that, it's like, oh, don't say that. Ooh, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? You should be embarrassed. You're you poor, you poor woman, this kind of thing. That's our culture's response. But yet it, in First Peter, it seems to prevent, present a completely opposite view that this is something that's precious in God's sight. Like, I'm just reading scripture here. I really think this seems pretty obvious. Um, for this is how holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves. How? By submitting to their own husbands exact same wording of the command he said for wives submit to your own husbands and he goes that's how holy women hey guys it's it's it certainly is in a bigger culture you know when they're looking back and they go hey 2000 years ago with abraham this was happening and it was a good thing and it was a good thing then too as sarah obeyed abraham obeyed abraham calling him lord and we'll talk about that because it doesn't mean what a lot of people think it means and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening so the example that comes really seems to rule out alternate interpretations to me, although we will talk about them later. If the context was a wife submitting for purely evangelism, Sarah would not be the example, right? If all Peter cared about was submit for the sake of evangelism, Sarah's, I mean, Abraham is the model of faith in the Bible. Clearly, she's not evangelizing her husband by submitting. This is just seen as a generally godly thing and good in marriage. Um, if submission, on the other hand, didn't ever involve just doing what the husband decides for the family, like because some people try to define submission like it doesn't mean that or doesn't involve that, then Sarah wouldn't be used as an example of someone who obeyed her husband. Right? Submission is seen as involving a sense of obeying. Now, I'd say a sense of obeying because some people were thinking like slave master obedience, micromanagement obedience, not having your own independence, not having your own pursuit, not having authority over anything. That's, to me, this, these are all bad views of submission. But how did Sarah obey? Well, Sarah went out with Abraham when God called him. She went with him into this promised land. I want you to understand how freaky that would have been. We're going to leave the land we know. Where are we going? I don't know exactly. It's just a land God told me he would show me as we journey. And Sarah goes, okay, I will yield to that. That there's a sense of obedience there, right? There's a sense of obedience, and it's a word that we don't like in our culture. And it's one be, that be, because in our culture, we rarely use the word obey unless we're using it in a diminishing capacity. It tends to have a pejorative connotation to it, right? But it didn't have it to them. We're just very, this is part of, I think, our 
our westernized individualism that it's it's like you don't even want to say when you when you do what your boss says that you're obeying your boss i mean you are you just don't want to use that word to describe it so it, it is obedience we just don't like the word because we're we have this sort of western pride i think in us at any rate we get to the next word which is calling him lord calling him lord um what exactly was this Genesis 18, 12 is the only time Sarah calls him Lord. Let's look at that verse real quick. So Sarah laughed to herself saying, after I'm worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? That's where she calls him Lord. Now it's not Lord like down here. See that capital L-O-R-D. When you see these capitals, that means it's the name of God, right? It's Yahweh. When you see this, it, it, it's more of a normal term in Hebrew or even somewhat normal in Greek, kurios in Greek. It's a term used of somebody who is authoritatively higher than you. That's all that it means. Um, there's two major points I should make on this. One, we don't have an equivalent term in English today for Lord the way they used to use it. N not even the word like boss. It doesn't work. I don't think Christian women today need to call their husbands Lord. I don't think that's the instruction here. Because, or you could call him whatever that Hebrew word is. Go find that out and see what she was calling him. But in English, like language changes over time. And we legitimately don't have a word that is commonly used that would be understood and accepted like with, uh, with, with knowledge as far as the meaning goes where a woman could call her husband this. Like, I don't know the word that's there. I don't know what word there is, what the equivalent is. I don't I don't know of it. If you guys do, please recommend it in the comments um, if you haven't uh, unsubscribed already. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I'm, I'm just so you guys know, I'm, I'm aware of how much I trigger people with this series. I, I'm at the same time, when I see how much it triggers some of you, I um, I just realize how, how important this series is because I'm not ashamed of what scripture teaches on these issues. And if I see Christians who get mad about what scripture teaches on these issues, and, and I'm not saying all of you get mad, but there are enough who do that I think I can address this. When I see this, I realize how much it has to be pushed. It has to be pressed because here's an area where modern Christians are very susceptible to not thinking biblically about these issues. And so scripture comes in and says things that don't feel like they fit our culture. And the, and the, the reason is A, it's just hard to understand with different cultures, but B, it doesn't fit our culture. Our culture should change. At least the Christian, at least your personal culture should change for these things. So the first point is, yeah, I don't think wives have to call their husbands the Lord. But the second point remains. She casually sees Abraham as the leader for their marriage and family enough that she can just refer to him with the pronoun Lord. So she casually does see the husband in that role. It is highly offensive in our culture to do this. Right? Again, the woman says, I need to, I'm going to have to ask my husband. Triggered. People are just triggered. In fact, husbands will say, I have to ask my wife, and everyone chuckles and laughs because it's acceptable for him to diminish his role, but it is not acceptable for the, the, the wife to suggest the opposite of the husband. So submission to husbands in First Peter seems like a general character quality for Christian women, not just a culturally bound issue. It's how holy women of the past behaved, let me summarize, which makes it a general rule. It's, it involves the beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in God's sight, which again makes it a general good character trait for wives and not just a cultural thing. Submission, however, is limited. In First Peter, it says submit to your own husband, not to every single man. This is even against some patriarchal and even some complementarian guys. I don't think all women have to submit to all men. I think that's a strange view that is even perhaps... Um, it can create awkwardness and weirdness and strange behavior, but it can also it also um, create danger for different situations. So submit to your own husband, not submit to every husband or submit to every man. That's not the rule. Now, some would respond to this this teaching in First Peter and say, well, that's abusive, Mike. That, that teaching is abusive. But I want to say that so often what I hear when people complain about the biblical teaching about husbands and wives is they only look at the wife aspect. They often view it through the trigger lens and not through what it clearly actually says. And they always ignore what the Bible says about husbands. Because once you incorporate what it says about husbands, it's hard to call it abusive. So let's look at that. Likewise, husbands, 
live with your wives with an understanding way. And this will trigger more people, but you, it's your fault. Showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. <laughs> Showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. They're co-heirs. So that you, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Now it's just one verse here to husbands. He explained it more in more detail to women. But to husbands, this is pretty powerful stuff. What is the husband required to do? He has to understand that she is, that he has to go with her with understanding. And that understanding relates specifically to really two things. First, that she is the weaker vessel. Now, a lot in our culture would see this as hugely insulting. Women are weaker vessels. Um, but most of humans throughout history would have intuitively understood this when they recognized, yes, I am better at opening the pickle jars. I can reach the things that she has a harder time reaching. When there's heavy, hard things to pick up, I take care of it. Like in my house, I'm I'm the one who's going to load this large stuff into the car, carry it over here, dump it out, and take it to the dump or whatever. Like, I'm going to be doing this. It's just assumed that I'm the one to do it. You know, we were <clears throat> um, gardening in our backyard recently. This year, we planted a whole bunch of stuff in the backyard and had to bring in a whole bunch of soil. You know, and they're they're like, I don't know if they're like 35 pound or 40 pound bags of soil. They're pretty big. And um, I just told my wife, like, I'll just I'll get them all. Don't worry about it. Because watching her struggle with one of these, she's not the strongest of her body. You know, it was like, no, I'll, honey, I'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. You know, and it wore me out. But it's like I'm just trying to show honor to her as the weaker vessel. A woman's physical body is the weaker vessel. If that's offensive to you, then just go watch the MMA fights where a man pretends he's a woman and goes and fights the women and seriously injures and hurts them. And you can realize quickly that this is dishonoring her because he is not treating her as the weaker vessel. When you pretend that men and women are the same, you dishonor them. You don't honor them. <clears throat> um, our culture is just so weird about this stuff. So weaker isn't lesser. This is the context. The vessel's just the body. It's not the soul. It's not the spirit of the person. It's just the physical body. So her weaker vessel is there. But it doesn't mean she's lesser. She's just weaker. It means that you give the weaker vessels greater care. In fact, he's using the vessel analogy, I think, on purpose because in your home, you have different vessels. And some of them are more durable and they can be put through more tough circumstances. But some are precious as the wife who is, the, who is an heir of the grace of life. She's a Christian. And um, at least most of them would have been in, in, in Peter's writing. And these are the vessels that are precious and special, like your fine china, and that you make sure is taken well care of, right? It's not an insult to say that the woman is like this more delicate, but very precious and elevated in value vessel. That's not an insult to say that, although some in the more feminist communities would say this, um, but I think that they've, they've misunderstood honor for dishonor. Um, so she is an heir of grace. That's the next thing. They're heirs with you of the grace of life. Women were seen as equal inheritors in the body of Christ as Christians. We've talked about this in a previous video, that they have that sonship quality. You could look back at the Galatians video, the egalitarian silver bullet text we talk about um, in one of the videos in this series. And so this is definitely an interesting and unique Christian perspective because as it comes to in Christ and in her eternal relationship with God, there's total equality, um, not just in value, but in inheritance. This is not the case for women in the culture as far as what they would inherit versus what men would inherit. There was a difference, but not in Christ. There was no difference. That's an interesting thing. So the husband is told this. Husbands, you need to have understanding with them, right? You need to show honor to them. You need to recognize that they're heirs with you of the grace of life. And then there's a threat so that your prayers may not be hindered. And to me, this is huge. Husbands, this is heavy. Are you failing to honor your wife? Are you failing to see her heirship, her inheritance in Christ? Are you failing to see these things and, and act like they're true? Because that's God's daughter and he will hold you accountable. Your prayers will actually be hindered. This is definitely counter culture in all cultures, really. Um, to say that God is intimately involved in the way that you treat your wife. Yes, you have an authority that's there, but you better not abuse it. You better honor her. You better treat her as an heir and a fellow heir in Christ. This is what I think is the heart of complementarianism. This is why I like the phrase complementarian. 
it isn't just an issue of who has more authority. That's one issue in the marriage, but it's also about mutual callings and accountability before God and that there's an equivalent spiritual value between husband and wife. And because there's equivalent value, but different authority, the one who has the more authority must labor the more to, in, to show and approve and honor the value of the other. This is a more complementarian view. Okay, let's look at our next passage. We'll, we'll, we'll look at the pushback from egalitarians after I run through these passages. This one will be pretty brief. Colossians 3 verses 18 and 19. Just two verses. Husbands, submit, uh, wives, excuse me, submit to your husbands. I started reading here. Uh, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Pretty straightforward, just a general rule for wives. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. I think that's a phrase we want to talk about. So simply put, this affirms a husband's authority in relation to the wife, and it does it in a couple different ways. First, a wife is simply told to submit. This is literally the only instruction in this letter in Colossians that Paul even bothers to mention towards wives. Wife, submit to your husbands. That's the only instruction that they're given. Right? As is fitting in the Lord. It's qualified, as is fitting in the Lord. That's the, another thing we want to recognize. This does two things. First, when you only have to submit as is fitting in the Lord, it limits submission as to only what is appropriate for obeying Christ's lordship first and foremost. You always obey Christ. You submit to others when it doesn't conflict with that. Second, it means submission is fitting for a Christian wife. If you want to obey God, you want to try to do this too. It's fitting in the Lord. That's, it just seems to be the plain teaching of the text. Like if you were just to read this, and know, you didn't know about any debates, and you just read the New Testament, you would see this balanced complementarian view, in my opinion, that you whether you use the term complementarian or not wouldn't matter to me. But you would see that sort of view. Let's talk about the third issue here. And that is here that husbands are not only told to love your wives, we'll talk more about that later. Right? Husbands are to love your wives. You're, you're not commanded to force them to submit, but you're commanded to love them. But also do not be harsh with them. This is an interesting phrase. This, in a way, affirms the husband's authority as well, because the husband would not be told, don't be harsh with your wives, except that he is in that position of, of a different authority. Notice how here it says, fathers, do not provoke your children. This is, of course, because the father has a very high, even much higher role of authority with a child than, than, a, than a wife, that much, much higher. It's very different. But he can provoke them. He can provoke them to wrath, provoke them to bitterness because he can misuse his authority. Here, where it says, husbands, love your wives and don't be harsh with them, that phrase, don't be harsh, in the Greek is actually, don't embitter them. Don't make them bitter. Husbands, you can misuse your authority in a way that makes your wife bitter. Now, her bitterness could be her fault, but it can very much also be your fault that you've fed into that and you've triggered that and you've caused that because you didn't love them and because you embittered them. So this, in a way, affirms the husband's authority because it's granted that she'll be submitting and this creates an opportunity for abuse. It does. It, there's a possibility for abuse. I mean, even, even when submitting, you can abuse your husband too. But it certainly creates a certain kind of, there's always opportunities for abuse is what I'm saying. In every marriage, egalitarian, complementarian, patriarchal, you name it, there's always opportunities for abuse. But it creates more opportunities for abuse when you have more authority. It just seems like that's the case. So since it is granted that she'll be submitting and that creates an opportunity for abuse, the husband is told not to be harsh, not to embitter her, but to love her. I would say first, uh, Colossians 3, verses 18 and 19, conclusion, is complementarian. Many egalitarians will only look at the wife's submission and they'll pass over these admonitions to love and then they'll conclude you know, that, that it's a harsh and abusive thing. But when you take the whole thing as a whole, which is the biblical teaching, that's not abusive. That looks complementarian to me. Let's look at 1 Timothy 2.5. This is one of the, the um, side passages I'll just briefly mention because it's going to come up very importantly very, very soon here. For there is one God and there is one mediator. Uh-oh, uh-oh, that's not the right verse. Um, it's Titus 2.5, isn't it? I think it's Titus. Yes, oh, I'm glad I remembered that. My notes are wrong there. I need to fix that. Um... 
maybe uh, Sarah if, if Zimmerman, if you if you hear this, can you fix the notes there where it says Mike's teaching through First Timothy two five? It should say Titus two five. I just I just typed in the wrong thing there, and I remembered it now. So Titus two five, it it admonishes these things. Um, older women are to train the younger women to do certain things. Train the younger women to what? To love their husbands and children, to be self controlled, working at home, kind, submissive to their own husbands. Remember the meat, the purpose, though, that the word of God may not be reviled. We will come back to that later. But these are, um, egalitarians will say that this was just for culture, and this verse proves it's just for culture. We'll get into that later. I just want to throw it out there that it's a general thing that you're supposed to teach the younger women to do. It's in that category of things that just all young women should be taught, according to Titus, which Paul wrote to a young Christian leader. All right, let's look at Ephesians 5. This is the big one. I'll try to teach this as fast as I can without losing you. you you're like, why are you trying to teach so fast? Well, because this video is going to be so long that my own brain is going to be mush. By the end, I might I might accidentally become egalitarian. <laughs> no offense to anybody. Just, just, it could happen. There's a chance. Um, so Ephesians 5, 21 through 33. First, there's the instructions to wives. Okay, starting with verse 21, because it's connected. Submitting to one another out of reverence of Christ, for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also um, wives should submit in everything to their own husbands. Okay, that, that's the instructions to the wife right there. That's where they end. I'll leave them on the screen for a moment. Here's elements that show in Ephesians 5 that this is a general rule in marriage. Um, number one, wives are told to submit to their husbands. Okay, this seems like a general rule. It's wives and husbands and there's no qualifiers. It's not wives and husbands who are unsaved. Wives and husbands who expect submission or in a culture that expects submission or something like that. It just says it is a general rule. If you just took it straightforward, it would feel that way. Number two, the husband is the head of the wife. This is a bigger point and a stronger point. Okay, this is just the role of a husband in relationship to the wife, according to Paul. It wasn't a real popular view of the time that they taught this head-body relationship between husband and wife. It's something that Paul is teaching, and it's connected. It's it's strongly, strongly supported in Scripture. You guys are welcome to check out last week's, last time's video, which is the Women in Ministry video series number eight, where I dealt with headship. Is male headship biblical? So that's a big deal, that wives should submit. Why? For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. That clearly involves authority. <clears throat> this is tied to the nature of marriage. It's the nature that a husband and wife have this head-body relationship, just as Christ and the church have this head-body relationship. And then the deep word study on the meaning of the term supports that. The third reason why this would support... Um, Submission in the sense that I described earlier in this video as a general rule is the analogy is that it's as Christ submits to the church, so wives should submit to their husbands. The, so the headship analogy, that implies it. The, the blanket statement of submitting, that implies it. But also the comparison of Jesus and the church because the church submits to Christ. This again is just obviously there. I don't think I need to explain it that well. Um, now to husbands, there's a lot more instructions. It goes from verse 25 to 33. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Again, the husband's told to love. Sound similar? Sound, sound familiar? That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. That's talking about Jesus there. So that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Notice that everything that Jesus did was for the benefit of the church. That's the kind of love the husband's supposed to have, purely for the benefit of his wife. Right? Real benefits, not felt benefits, not doing not happy wife, happy life. That's different. Those are felt benefits. But holy wife. Happy God. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It doesn't rhyme, but it's more accurate. Verse 28. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. 
Remember that head body analogy? The husband's the head? Well, if she's your body, you should love her like you do your own body. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it, this is, this is deep, it, what's it? The it is a man leaving his father and mother and the two becoming one flesh. Two becoming one flesh, that's the it. It refers to Christ in the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Okay, briefly going over this. Well, my version of briefly. Um, the husband's role is to love and take care of his wife. That's self-sacrificial. It's the highest kind of role that a, that a, the hi highest kind of love role that a person could have. So it's not like, do you love her? Of course I love her, but blah, 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 blah. No, it's like deeply self-sacrificial care, concern, love, throw myself under the bus for her without, you know, with, without a moment's reflection. Like this is, this is my gut thing is to bless her. Um, it's all for her benefit, not just her happiness. This is deeply important that I say this. It is not happy wife, I say again. It is not happy wife, happy life. It is for her to be spiritually splendorous. Is that a word? Right? There it is, the splendor. Splendorful. For her splendorosity to be manifest, splendorificness to be going on there. Her sanctification and her holiness, not just her happiness as in, because she might be getting happy through the flesh being pleased, right? Um, so this is a deep concern for her genuine well-being. Verse 28, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. We're to nourish and cherish her. He's one flesh with her. These are all deeply, deeply self-sacrificial, self-concern type things being projected towards the wife. As much as I care for me, I care for her. And he's one flesh with her. This is all because this is this is this is important the entire analogy of what husbands do with wives and what wives do with husbands is all wrapped up in the fact that Paul sees and teaches under the inspiration of the spirit that a husband is the head of the wife it's a head body relationship he's the head i'll show you again verse 23 the husband is the head of the wife even as Christ is the head of the church his body now some say well the wife's not seen as the body here in this passage but that's that's not true Verse 30, uh, 28, excuse me, says what? In the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. Do you see that it is a head body analogy all the way along, which definitely implies that husband's leadership role. So more evidence of submission can be seen in the inherent nature of marriage, not just that it's not just in culture. Verse 31 and 32 are sometimes skipped over by people. Here it talks about the nature of marriage. It quotes Genesis. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Paul has described the one flesh relationship of husband and wife as head body. That's the nature of the one flesh. But he grounds the he grounds the um, the relationship not in culture or custom, but in creation. The two shall become one. God made them that way. That's where this head body relationship begins and starts. And verse thirty two. He says this mystery is profound, and I'm saying it refers to Christ and the church. The nature of marriage is a representation of Jesus and the church, which is what? It's a loving and submitting relationship, Jesus and the church. And so husbands love, wives submit. This is grounded in creation and grounded in salvation. Your marriage is kind of a pretty important thing to represent the will of God in creation and the will of God in salvation. This is not culturally bound. You could stop the video at this point but then you won't know all the things people say that to tell you that I'm wrong. <laughs> so we're going to get into all that. So quick questions, quick questions to run through. Um, does this mean the wife has no authority? Um, no, no. Even in the ancient culture, they all understood the woman to have great authority in the home, even saying things like she rules the home, but it didn't mean rules as opposed to her husband, but rather she's like, you know, when you have responsibilities that you're not being micromanaged, you are actually in charge of things, even though somebody else might come and might say, hey, no, I want to do that differently. Um, so they all understood in that ancient culture, the woman had great authority in the home, just that the husband was higher. 
The teaching in scripture that children should obey their parents, plural, shows that a wife has authority. Proverbs saying, listen to the instruction of your mother, the commands of your mother affirms that as well. First Corinthians 7, we'll talk about in a minute. It shows that a woman has true claims she can lay on her husband, like I need this, I expect this, but not that she could do this on any issue she wants, just like a husband can't do that on any issue he wants. Dignified submission is what we're talking about here. A dignified submission with true authority, but not the same authority as her husband. That's what we're saying. That's what I think is the biblical teaching on this topic. So can the wife, and I have to cover this because I know if I don't mention it, people will, be, it'll, it'll be like a broken record in their head if they don't. So really quickly, I've dealt with this in other videos on uh, what, what a wife, what wife submit really means, where I took a lot longer to unpack all these issues, but I don't have the time today. So can a wife ever rebel or reject the decisions or instructions of a husband? And I think the answer is clearly yes. So with life and safety issues, yes, you can, you can, when it comes to life and safety issues, you can reject instructions of all kinds of people, including a husband. Um, Abigail's an example of this in the Old Testament. Her husband was being foolish and she went behind his back and gave goods that her husband had um, away, her family had, her and her husband, away to David's, David's army and so saved his, his life and is commended for it. I think this is an example of, hey man, you, you, I submit to my husband, but, but here he is being a great fool and putting her whole family in danger. This isn't just an issue of submission. This is now an issue of safety. Um, also, if he's asking for submission in an area where his authority is not meant to cover then why do you have to submit to that? Right, like, like imagine if I stood over my wife and I said, when you pray, I want you to say, Father God, every five seconds. Now there's plenty of people who actually do pray this way, just a cultural thing, I wouldn't make a big deal about it, but let's suppose that I told her, when you pray, I want you to say, Father God, every five seconds. That's an instruction from her husband. Why, if you're supposed to submit? Like, submission was never intended for me to control her prayer life. So no, she doesn't need to. Here's where some reasonable common sense needs to come into place, lest we get weird. Um, your prayer life, the color shirt you can wear, how you can laugh, <laughs> like micromanaging the wife is not good. Now there's some biblical support for this I could offer and I'll give you a brief overview of Proverbs 31, right? A mention of a few verses there. Proverbs 31 describes this ideal woman, okay? She's obviously considered a wonderful example for women. And she's, she, in verse 11, this Proverbs 31 woman, it says, the heart of her husband trusts her. That's the ideal thing. A husband who micromanages his wife does not trust his wife. This is, this is the opposite of ideal. You want to create space for decision-making and uh, levels of leadership to be taking place in people's lives, or you don't trust them, or you don't, or, and maybe, maybe you can't trust them because maybe they're like mentally challenged in a way that you you have to actually control and micromanage everything but that would be the exception to the rule um verses 13 through 15 this proverbs 31 woman she not only does work but seems to take charge of that work in verse 13 through 15 if that's the goal if her goal is to take charge of that work then micromanaging constricts that it forces people to be incapable it makes it so that they cannot take charge of anything right her husband would still be the lead in the home but she is doing some pretty bold things elsewhere. Maybe I should just put this on screen for you to look at as I talk about it. Proverbs 31, 13 through 15, there you go. She seems to be taking charge of these things that are going on here, this ideal woman. Then in verse 16, it says she considers a field and buys it. Wait, who does? She considers a field. She's using her judgment on whether or not she should buy a field for a financial investment. She's doing. She has a small business effectively, right? She's doing her own sort of entrepreneurial pursuits. That's considered a good thing. That's a lot of authority being used without constant instruction. Now, is she going against her husband? No, no one should interpret it that way. But she seems to be making some uh, real decisions here. So micromanagement would not fit the ideal woman. So why would you do this to your wife? Why wouldn't you want to empower her to be making smart choices and be intelligent and wise and thoughtful? Yet there's a layer of, yet husband, I still see you as the head. I still would would yield, you know, when, when that's needed and when that's important. Um, okay, let me talk now briefly about 1 Corinthians 7, because this is a verse that I would say complementarians, people in my camp, rarely notice, um, at least on the normal, like, pastoral level, they rarely notice that it may relate to this issue of authority in marriage. And egalitarians use it 
too much. Um, so here we are. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, he says, oh, I should go to verse three through five. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. The general view here is that um, intimacy between husband and wife is a responsibility that you owe to your partner. The husband owes it to his wife. The wife owes it to her husband. The Corinthians were starting to think that all of these relation, sexual excuse me, sexual relations were inherently bad. Um, and so they were trying to abstain at all times. This is uh, something that's bothered, plagued the church, this erroneous view about sex, um, especially in the Middle Ages and the, in the around the late early church. So for the wife does not have authority over her own body. <laughs> and I know that would, that would bother a lot of people, but wait, listen to both sides. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. What is this teaching? This is, this is a. This is basically saying, wife, you have a sexual right claim over the body of your husband, specific, specifically on sexual issues. Not that you control him on everything. Husband, you have a right to claim over your wife. Doesn't mean you can force yourself. Okay, forced. That's there's a word for that. R A P E. Right. There's a word for that. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about rights, not forcing anything, not violating people's wills. We're talking about what's morally good in a marriage. So the wife has authority over her husband's body. This is huge. This means that in relation to sexual rights, it rules out polygamy. Because a wife has authority over that husband's body, he cannot go and use that body somewhere else. This is against the Greek and Roman ideal that thought that men could, could fornicate and women shouldn't. So it could protect the offspring line. Um, this is against... The Jewish view that even supported it, at least they were debating it at the time, but those who supported polygamy, this is against that view as well. Because if the wife has a right over her husband's body, then he can't go and try to become one with somebody else. Interesting point there. Now, egalitarians will say that this single verse, verse 4, proves complementarians wrong because it shows that authority in marriage is equal in every, in every way. Um, but that, of course, is wrong because the context is sexual rights, conjugal rights. In that, there is an equality in authority, but not in every way is there an equality in authority. But it does show this, that submission is limited. A wife's submission is a limited thing. That's important. Finally, let me draw some... Uh, Conclusions here, and then we're going to do the First Peter rebuttal from the egalitarian. So finally, husbands didn't have all the authority that their culture wanted to give them. While a wife's submission is taught in Scripture and a husband's authority is taught there consistently, and I think clearly, they didn't have the same authority that their culture wanted to give them. Sexually, they did not have that same authority. Jesus, another point, Jesus rejected a male right to divorce. They thought it was a male prerogative. He totally rejected that. And the New Testament removed any restrictions on educating women in like religious matters. And one of the fears of that was that it was somehow going to like threaten authority. And so these are ways the New Testament goes against the culture of the time. Callings also are mutually exclusive. This is a significant point. The husband, here's what I mean by that. The husband is never told to make his wife submit. Some of the people at the time would have been like, husbands, you have to keep your wife in submission. The New Testament never says that. It says, wife, submit. It never says, husband, make your wife submit. That, to me, I believe this is where abuse takes place. The attempt to force others to submit against their will is where abuse takes place. It's one thing when you're dealing with a child, right, where I'm going to try to force a three-year-old to submit against their will. That's part of good parenting. I'm not going to do this with an adult. That would become abusive to that relationship. Husband... You are never told to make your wife submit, even though it is said of elders that they have to make their children submit. They have to keep their children in subjection, but it's never said about their, their relationship with their wives. Interesting. Also, the wife is never told to make her husband love her or to make him lead well, because this means that it removes a lot of the tension and the abuse that comes in marriage because the wife is like, Lord, I'm just going to honor you in my role, whether my husband does or not. The husband goes, Lord, I'm going to honor you in my role, whether the, my wife does or not. And I'm not fixated on the things they're doing wrong. I'm fixated on my obedience to Christ. This is one of the healthiest things you can put into a marriage is that that fixation on obedience to Christ 
and not on them doing the right thing all the time. Finally, I'll just say all of these verses, they seem complementary 100% of the way through. And the core of my interpretation is not new. There's nothing brand new that I'm giving in the core of what I'm saying. Church history has very strongly supported it. Um, that's not a trump card, but church history can be important. Because if something has never been viewed in church history, has never had a significant following throughout church history, you got to wonder why nobody noticed that. That would be, it, it would at least require explanation. Now, egalitarian pushback. Let's dig into it. This is where the rest of the video is going to all be just where egalitarians say that this view that I've expressed, where I, I think is the straightforward teaching of scripture, is wrong. Going into it, I was open to changing my mind on my, my views here, but here's, here's why I didn't. Here's why I haven't changed my mind. More importantly, who cares what my mind is on this issue? Here's the other side of the story for those who go, what are the points someone would make against Mike's views? How would they interpret those passages so I can think it through? So here we go. This is Peter Davids, a scholar who talks about 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. That was the first one I brought up where Peter talks about wives submitting and husbands loving, but not, but also honoring and um, treating them well as co-heirs in Christ. This is his view of 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. And we find it in, in the book, um, Discovering Biblical Equality, which is one of the, um, one of the top level books for like, hey, these are what scholarly egalitarians believe. So Peter David's view is this. The reason any wife submits to her husband is for evangelism, and that is the only reason. The only reason. Let me put First Peter up for you to see. The reason a wife submits is for evangelism, and that's the only reason, which means it's culturally bound. Right? In a culture that expects a wife to submit, well, a wife should submit to that husband so at least he becomes Christian. Then after he becomes Christian, maybe then we can explain to him that this unequal authority is not really a thing anyways, but we do it for evangelism. David's, Peter Davids, he sees family, this is important, family itself as a human construct. Think about this. He sees family as a human construct. Therefore, any commands about submission are culturally bound because they're about a human construct called family and they don't refer to anything intrinsic in the nature of marriage in general. Okay, let me show you these quotes because you're like, he doesn't really say that, Mike. Yeah, but he does though. He said, uh, so 1 Peter 3, 1 begins, I'm quoting Peter Davids now, with submit to your husband's language that has already been used in 1 Peter 2, 13 and 18. This is an attitude that Christian subjects are to show to rulers and Christian slaves to masters, but in each case, it's a qualified submission. Since believers in Christ know themselves in reality to be immigrants or resident aliens, thus they are not really part of the structures of this present age. And then he lists the structures, whether governmental or familial, which are human creations. So what Peter Davids has done is, in, in, and I'm just going to be, be somewhat blunt here. I don't mean this to be rude to the, to the man himself, but he's talking about marriage that affects all of us. And so we need to be pretty straightforward. What he's done is he said that marriage itself is a human creation. The structure, the way that marriage works is purely a human creation. And therefore, when Peter's like, you're not of this world, that's sort of implying that this human structure of marriage doesn't really apply to you as Christians. And therefore, the only reason for a wife to submit is just to reach out to someone who's part of those human structures, a non-believing husband. Now, Peter, let's evaluate this quote a bit. In 1 Peter, it does talk about us being sojourners. And it's a huge point of 1 Peter. I, verse by verse teaching through 1 Peter, I think it's a massive point throughout the book, yes. But what of the idea that family structures like male headship is a human creation. Does First Peter say that? No. Would Peter have thought male headship was a human creation? I don't think so. Let's look at scripture. First Peter chapter three, verse 13 and 14. It says here, um, does it? 
Oh, chapter two. That's what I did wrong. I'm like, that's not right. No, I'm quoting scripture wrong. All right, First Peter chapter two, verses thirteen and fourteen. Be subject uh, for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Here's where Peter talks about human institutions, and then he lists them, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. Does Peter think family is a human institution? Not in this verse. This is hijacking one statement of Peter in chapter 2 and transplanting it over to chapter 3 and suggesting that everything after, every, after he says human institution, you can just add anything you want into the mix, including family. That's not the case. The emperor and the governors are the things that are part of the human institutions. If we think family structure itself is merely a human creation, then the presumption of culture, not God, being the source of the nature of the institution will lead us directly down the path of being able to set aside role differences in marriage. So you get the logic, but his logic doesn't work with scripture. Is that what Peter thought? Only if you radically stretch the meaning human institution in some important ways. First, you have to see chapter 2, verse 13, which I just showed you guys. I'll put on the screen again. As the heading for chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, but it could easily be explained as just the heading for the verses that follow as he moves on to other issues that relate to submission, right? It relates to being subject, but it doesn't relate to human institutions as in not from the Lord. But there's another bigger issue, and that is, are governments really just human institutions? I think that Peter Davids has misunderstood Peter the Apostle um, because he views human institutions as merely human institutions. But when we look at Romans 13, verse 1, it says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there's no authority except from God. And those that exist have been what? Instituted by God. Authority is, uh, governments are human institutions, but they're not merely or only human institutions. There's a layer of, in which God has ordained for them to take place, at least for a season. So, no, First Peter doesn't mean that um, on any level. It, for Peter David's view to, to, to stand. It just, it just doesn't, it doesn't work. There's other scriptures showing that marriage is not merely a human institution. Genesis chapter one, right? I'll just, I'll run through these quickly I'll, without putting them on screen for the sake of time, because this is going to be a 17 hour video already. Um, uh, you, you think I'm joking? I'm not even sure if I'm joking at this point. <laughs> um, so there's other scriptures showing that marriage is not just a human institution. Genesis one and two. I already dealt with this in the second video on my Women in Ministry series, but it says here that, um, you know, when, when God creates Adam and Eve, Adam says, this is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Is that a human institution? No. Jesus commenting on Genesis 2 in Matthew 19, 6, uh, I have to put it on your screen because it's, it, it, watch, watch is better. You'll see. Matthew 19, 6, Jesus commenting on Genesis 2 says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. I'm sorry, I skipped ahead. They are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. So it's clearly God's joining them together. This is not a human institution. Um, then Paul, in a passage we already covered, Ephesians 5, 31 and 32, literally talking about Genesis, the same verse as Jesus, God's institution of marriage. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. I'm saying it refers to Christ and the church, which is a headship body relationship, which is a love and submission relationship. And the reason, and that is the reason why each of you should love his wife and she should respect her husband, which does imply submission. We'll talk about that more later. See also video number two on this series, the Women in Ministry series, where I go into a ton of detail on this, more detail than you are aware was probably there, but hopefully it will help you. The next quote from Peter Davids, the next quote from Peter Davids is this. Keep in mind that his view requires that the only, and I stress that word, only reason for a wife to submit to her husband is for evangelism. So here's his quote. 
To be sure, the woman accepts her husband's authority, but not because she recognizes it as intrinsic, as Plato and Aristotle would have it, or as a universal divine structure, as some pagan moralists and the Hellenized Jews, Jews Josephus and Philo taught it. Rather, she does so in order to evangelize him and keep Christian teaching in good repute. It's not just that evangelism is one purpose of submitting. It is the only purpose. But Peter, the apostle, he gives this instruction to wives of Christian husbands too. If we go back to 1 Peter chapter 3, verses, verse 1, it, this is abundantly clear. Wives, be subject to your own husbands. Broad category. That even if some do not obey the word. Hey, I'm talking to all wives, and some of you will have non-Christian husbands. This, it, it's, clear, it's clear that evangelism is not the only purpose here. Um, let me take you to the next one. Okay, this is another quote from, from, uh, from David's on this issue. He says, even if women with Christian husbands were included, their behavior would likewise be conditioned on the evangelistic motive of this text. Um, there's a few problems with this. This is what we call adding to the text of Scripture. He's assuming that the motive and reason for the submission is for evangelism, where it has not been stated. It is stated that in the case of a wife with a husband who's non-believer, it, it might might aid in evangelism, secondary possible benefit. But nowhere does Peter indicate a Christian woman submitting to a Christian husband is for evangelism. The fact that it's the case only for the non-believer who, you know, who, the Christian woman who has a non-believing husband, that that might be for evangelism in that case implies that it's not the case for the Christian woman with a Christian husband. You might need to replay that back. I think that's a good logic, though. So 1 Peter shows that the wife's submission is about overall character, and overall character leads to evangelism, not just not, it's not just about evangelism. Godly character leads to evangelism, right? When, when Jesus told us, let your light so shine before the world that it'll, they'll see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven, it's not as though good works aren't good. They lead to evangelism, but, but they're also just inherently good. That, I think, is the context of 1 Peter. And we saw this earlier when we looked at 1 Peter and saw that there's all these extra reasons that's respectful and pure conduct, right? It is the um, hidden person of the heart, gentle and quiet spirit. It's, God, it's precious in God's sight. It's what holy women of old had done, and they submitted, and it was a godly thing. Okay, this is all way beyond evangelism. There's an imbalance, though, in Peter David's interpretation, and this it, this is not an uncommon egalitarian view that he represents. Does David think that husbands loving their wives and understanding them is also just for evangelism? Does a husband's love for his wife, is that purely a human construct? Husbands, you don't really need to love your wives. I'm just saying it'll help in evangelism. <laughs> They, people will treat, egalitarians will treat the commands to wives and the commands to husbands with different standards sometimes. And you'll see this more as we keep going. My conclusion is that Peter is not just concerned about optics. Another problem with the view that uh, David's has is that just because something's going to be useful in evangelism, it doesn't follow that it's only for the purpose of evangelism. I quoted already Jesus saying that we would let our good works shine before him and that they'd see our Father in heaven. I mean, I think they'd see, they'd give glory to our Father in heaven. I think that the apostles viewed morally good behavior as a good witness. Think about this. Regardless of whether it was only cultural or a transcendent rule for all human behavior. So there's other problems with this view. I'll get into them in Ephesians 5. What about the reference to Sarah obeying Abraham and calling him Lord? So the scholar Peter Davids says it's not a reference to, and this is, this is where it gets a little, a little unexpected. Um, Peter says, Peter, the apostle, he says that Sarah called Abraham Lord. Genesis 18, 12. Um, Davids has like a three point case why this is not, we're misinterpreting it. He says, first, Genesis 18, 12 does not have Sarah submitting to Abraham much in that exact verse. He's not, she's not actually submitting much. She just calls him Lord in that verse. 
Number two, other Genesis passages where she does what Abraham wants her to do and asks her to do, they don't have her specifically call him Lord. Even though, even though Genesis does have her submitting to Abraham, doing what he wants, and calling him Lord. But yet, it doesn't do them in the exact same verse or passage, so he says it doesn't count. And three, this is where it gets a little tricky, extra-biblical accounts. Extra-biblical accounts have Sarah calling Abraham Lord more often. And that is where I had to do some extra research, and I'm going to make you listen to it. <laughs> okay, let me first share with you his conclusion which is that you know Peter's not appealing to a biblical standard, he's appealing to a cultural one. It goes like this. It seems most likely that his reference to Sarah, in his reference to Sarah, he's using material known to his readers from these contemporary Jewish sources. Here, Sarah is depicted in terms of an ideal Hellenistic wife, an illustration that serves Peter's purpose. Christian wives will be Sarah's daughters among the holy women if they are also good Hellenistic wives and emulate her Greco-Roman virtue, that is, to do good and refuse to fear. If you can understand Peter David's view, let me share with you what I think the problems are with this view. Number one, every element about Sarah in 1 Peter 3 is found in Genesis. Every single element. She obeys Abraham leaving for the promised land. She calls him Lord. She obeys him in other ways too. Um, why look outside what Peter saw as authoritative scripture when what he refers to is found in authoritative scripture? I think 1 Peter 3, Sarah calls him Lord. That fits Genesis well because it's in Genesis 18, 12. Like, I don't, I don't know why this is a challenge. Um, number two, second problem. Even if Peter was referring to extra biblical works, like the Testament of Abraham, we'll get into in a second, it doesn't mean it was just a cultural concept. Because what, what Peter Davies is saying, hey, if he's not referring to Genesis, but he's referring to these extra biblical, more, more recent works like the Testament of Abraham, then maybe it's a Greco-Roman standard that they're appealing to. But, I, but how do you build a bridge there? How do you conclude that Abraham isn't actually appealing to real holy women of old who were holy back then and not just in fantasy literature about those women from the local time. But there were also problems with Peter David's Hellenistic texts, and this is what took some homework to figure out. So he only actually, he, he mentions several, he says there's several, there's a bunch, the implication as you read it is that there's a number of places where in, in like literature going around during the Apostles' time, Sarah is talked about and she calls Abraham Lord, but he only actually mentions one, and that is the Testament of Abraham. Because he only mentions one, I think we just have to focus on the one. And he seems to mention it as his best example. Let's go to that. Uh, just a second. I got to get this one up for you, PD. Okay. I'm just going to have to put it on the screen like this. Um, he says, uh, but do we find Sarah frequently using kurios? That's the word Lord in Greek. When referring to or addressing Abraham in extra canonical Jewish works, such as the Testament of Abraham, roughly contemporary with 1 Peter. We'll check that claim in a minute. In this work, especially, kurios is, is used by Sarah to address Abraham, usually my kurios to Abraham, my Lord Abraham. Although only in casual or solemn discourse, not in context of obedience. And, uh, you know, they say the devil's in the details. Well, well that's a weird phrase, but it is... Um, in this case, accurate. Let's talk about the Testament of Abraham. The Testament of Abraham, was it really written before First Peter was written? That's very debatable. E.P. Sanders, who's kind of an important, like authoritative type scholar, he says the Testament of Abraham is a Jewish work, probably of Egyptian origin, which is generally dated to the later part of the first century AD. At least according to E.P. Sanders, there's a good chance it was not in circulation at the time of Peter and was not even in Greek at the time of Peter. The Jewish Encyclopedia says it was probably written in Jewish, not Greek originally, which means it's not this Hellenistic source in the first place. So the Testament, it's not even Hellenistic like he needs it to be to make his points. Peter Davids relies on the less common view that it was written before the first century, but then he adds another very important view. So it's not, most people don't hold that view, but he adds more to that. 
that it's widely circulated. It started in Egypt, but he thinks that it's out there in Asia, that it's gotten into all these other locations and is so well known that Peter can casually refer to it, even though Genesis has her calling him Lord, and everyone's going to know he's talking about this other work that was just written, right? the ink's barely dry, and somehow it's traveled all over the place, and, and it's in Greek now, and we are all familiar with it, and we're going to assume he means that and not Genesis. This is a bad theory. There's more, though. As he acknowledged in the... In the I'll put it back on your screen just for a moment. Um... Their last highlighted phrase, although, you know, Sarah calls him Lord, but only in casual or solemn discourse, not in context of obedience. So the Testament of Abraham is bad because it probably wasn't written. If it was written, it probably wasn't known. If it was written and known, it wasn't Hellenistic. Those are three things he needed it to be. And four, one of his complaints about Genesis was, yeah, Sarah calls him Lord, but she's not obeying him in that very verse. She's just calling him Lord which I don't think she needs to. Okay, I think it's a weird standard. But when Sarah calls Abraham Lord in the Testament of Abraham, she's not obeying him in those verses either. It's just a normal way of talking. So the thing that he says disqualifies Genesis would also disqualify the Testament of Abraham, meaning that this is reaching for straws. And this is unfortunately what happens. And normal people like you and me, we go to these sources, these scholars, and we think there must be a lot behind these claims and these footnotes. And then you dig deep and you find out it's smoke and mirrors in this case. You can see how he dodges the obvious. Let's look at the next quote from Peter Davids. Two encouragements are given to support such behavior. First, this kind of behavior can lead to the conversion of a non-believing husband. Second, it puts the wife in a class of holy women of Judaism, whose behavior brought divine approval. Peter's example is Sarah especially as portrayed in the Testament of Abraham. If Christian wives follow this model, they will likewise be considered holy women, approved by God, for they will fit the virtues of their culture insofar as those virtues are consistent with Christian virtues. What? Half of that's made up. Okay, the other half is the, the Bible part. So you could see the reliance on the Testament of Abraham, wrongly so. Not Note how even the phrase, holy women approved by God, is taken as merely being in the eyes of the culture. Yet it's holy women approved by God, not holy women in the eyes of your culture. It doesn't. It's just the opposite of what it means. Nothing in 1 Peter implies holy in the eyes of your culture. Nor can I think of any place in the Bible where the word holy is used as a subjective cultural term and not an actual holiness term. I don't know of anywhere where the word is used that way ever. So notice the internal contradiction finally, right? Considered holy women, that's called cultural. Approved by God in the eyes of culture. Like it just, all right, I'll move on. Uh, Craig Keener has one addition he'll add to this and that is the following. And this is the last thing I'll say about 1 Peter 3. He says here that it says, um, Further, while Sarah, in his 1 Peter example, obeys Abraham and calls him Lord, Abraham also obeys Sarah. See the Hebrew in Genesis 16, 2 and 21, 12. Um, this is a, a, an interesting way to argue because it's not really arguing like, Here's a conclusion. I'm just going to throw out an observation and I'm going to let you, because if you keep reading in Keener's work, he doesn't give you the conclusion. But his basic point is there's mutual submission. Hey, they both obey each other. So there's nothing unequal here. That's the implication. But is this a moment or an ordering of an ongoing relationship? When Abraham obeys Sarah, and when you can read about this, Genesis 21, 12 is the better example. Genesis 16, 2, it's, it's actually uh, not, it's not, not a good example. Uh, it doesn't help the case at all. But Genesis 21.12 says, But God said to Abraham, Be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you, for through Isaac your offspring shall be named. Notice though, okay, it says whatever Sarah says, do it. Keener says, in the first Peter example, Peter uh, Sarah obeys Abraham, but also Abraham in quotes, obeys Sarah. Here, he's not obeying Sarah. The Hebrew, which I did look at for Keener, Craig Keener's request, it's the word for to hear, hama, 
Strong's number 8085 if you want to look it up. The word means to hear. Does it imply obedience in the relevant sense? No, because frequently in scripture, God is hearing his people. He hears them. It doesn't mean he obeys them. It means you hear them with a positive ear that is, implies acceptance. You know, like, yes, I hear you. I'll, I'll help. I'll do the thing you request. But it doesn't imply obedience that relates to authority in any way. So Keener's pushback seems irrelevant to the passage. All right. Um, for the sake of the stream and how long it is, I need to take a small break for reasons you may be able to guess. I'm just going to walk away for a minute. I'll be right back. All right, <laughs> were you able to read all the books on my bookshelf? <laughs> Sorry, guys. This is I was prepping for this one, and I thought I, I can't really cut it up into pieces. It's gonna do. It's gonna really mess up the the long term impact of the video if I take key elements and I split them into separate videos. At least my intention, my my overall like complicated agenda for this series um, of how I want the videos to be structured. It's not by length. It's by topic. So this one is gonna be long. Let's look now. At the egalitarian view of Colossians 3, verses 18 and 19. Okay, Colossians 3, 18 and 19 is only, it's just two verses. I covered it earlier. Looks like a complementarian type passage. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. We're going to look at Lynn Kohick's uh, treatment of this one, and here it is. Lynn Kohick, the scholar, egalitarian scholar, and who I consider all these scholars brothers and sisters in Christ. They're believers. They're evangelical Christians. They're not, they're not, some egalitarians are like, yeah, the Bible's wrong. Like that's their, that's their view. Um, these are not them. Um, so she says, there is no talk about the husband's authority or a female's inferior ontological status. It just doesn't happen. Instead, Paul points to Christ, whose word is to dwell deeply within each believer's thankful heart. To respond to that, I will show you the verse again. No talk of the husband's authority. Now, this is a trick where we say, oh, it has the word submit, and it says husbands don't be harsh, which both imply there's authority, but it doesn't have the word authority, and therefore there's no talk of the husband's authority. But this is playing games with the scriptures. I don't think we can do this. She's told to submit. He's told not to be a harsh. Both of these imply authority. And the original audience all, and I don't know any scholar who would argue with this. The original, and I'd be surprised if, if there are, like I'd be surprised that somebody would actually argue this, that wives submit to your husbands, that, that every person reading this in the New Testament times in the first century would have known that this implied the husband had authority, had a, a higher degree of authority to some sense than his wife. They all would have understood the word hupotasso to mean that, that that's, it's just weird. To, it just sort of hand waved away to say that there's just, no talk of a husband's authority. She says a female's inferior ontological status. Oh, I agree with that. But I don't believe in a female's inferior ontological status. Like, I don't believe that. This is what egalitarians will try to tell us. I'm, I'm you know, complementarians, you have to believe that. And then they'll argue against it. Well, I don't believe that. So I'm not going to argue. Um, so the next... There it is. 
Um, in the sense of bitterness, uh, oh, I don't know why I read that part. Okay, so she says, Paul warns against husbands using domination and power given them by their patriarchal culture such that they despise their wives. There's not a lot egalitarians write about Colossians 3, 18 and 19. It's usually just passed over and not discussed much. But here, this is a good example of assuming the conclusion. Paul in Colossians is writing uh, when he says, husbands, don't be harsh with your wives. He's saying, don't use the domination and power, which means that she thinks don't be harsh does relate to authority, doesn't she? Right? Don't be harsh relates to authority. But it's the power given them by their patriarchal culture. That's assuming the conclusion. Where in Colossians does it say that the husband's role was merely and only given to him by a culture and not established in the created order? It doesn't say that. This is presuming your conclusion. This assumption, the assumption is that the parts that relate to male leadership in marriage are merely there because of culture and Paul's only limiting them. But that's not what the text says. It also goes against her previous statement. Because you can't say there's no talk of a husband's authority and then it's a warning against using the domination and power. Well, how could it not be about it but also be about it at the same time? I don't know how to reach somebody if they're convinced that male leadership in the home or church is inherently evil. Uh, what, what could the Bible ever say to correct you? That's what the first video in the series was all about, was letting the Bible speak. A more fitting view, I think, is that Paul is affirming the authority of the husband, but with important Jesus-like caveats. The wife is told to submit, that affirms that authority, but the husband is told, he's not told to take authority. For submission is a serious problem, that is not found in scripture. The husband is told to love the wife. His focus is on love, not him being in control, right? That impacts his leadership. And this is hugely important because I can see being a married man for 13 years, I can see how a focus on leading can turn into insecurities and rudeness and constantly checking to see if my wife is yielding to me and everything and everything becomes a power struggle and that is an unhealthy environment for anybody but the bible does not encourage that so the husband is warned about not being harsh this isn't a rejection of his authority it's a how to use your authority kind of rule just like what jesus says so let me give you an example of a parallel to the colossians passage mark chapter 10 verse 42 to 45 one of the important things about interpreting scripture is that it's not only consistent with the context, but it's consistent with other scriptures as well. Here's an example I think of that. Jesus called to them, uh, called them to him and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. Some egalitarians take this to mean Nobody has authority. A few do. Most don't. Linda Belleville is probably the biggest example, I think. Um, I think that's a misunderstanding of Jesus here. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man, even the Son of Man who has all authority, all authority has been granted to me, Jesus says, right? He definitely has authority. Came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus is saying, hey, those who, are, those who have the greatest power should be doing the greatest service for others. It doesn't mean they don't have power or authority. It's how they use it. That's what Paul's doing with marriage. He's doing this with a husband's role of authority. Your authority, husband, is not there to just make sure it's always there. Your authority is not there for your authority. It's there so you could serve your wife, so you could bless her, so you could be in a model of Christ to the family, and you could lovingly self-sacrifice, not just to make them happy, but to make them holy. Paul puts this into practice in his letters. He never claims he doesn't have authority, but he's always really careful about how he uses his authority. Let's look at um, 2 Corinthians 13, 10. For this reason, I write these things while I'm away from you, that when I come, um, just making sure I got the right spot. Yeah, that when I come, I may not have to be severe in my use of the authority that the Lord has given me for the building, for building up and not for tearing down. Paul had authority, but he tried really hard not to use it. 
And that's the nature of godly authority is it's under restraint at all times because we value, and I could do a whole study on this, but we value the free will, the love, the voluntary submission and obedience of the other people, and we do not value merely our authority. And that stops abuse. Egalitarians don't generally have much to say about Colossians 3.18, so I'm just going to kind of pass over to the next passage now. That's about it. So like, unless you found those good rebuttals, then you think Colossians 3.18 feels like a pretty strong text for the classic view of marriage. Um, some others, by the way, will say a more complicated view I won't deal with in detail here, but I think that it's a bad view if you look into it in any, in any detail yourself. So that is the view that, yes, Paul was definitely telling wives and, and Colossae to submit to their husbands and that the husbands have more authority, but... And here's where they do this sort of cultural, like, like, start drawing lines around the culture. And they go, because in Colossians, men had authority. But in other places, like where they had less authority, Paul doesn't tell them to submit to their husbands. And so they look at any letter Paul wrote where he doesn't mention submission as evidence that women weren't submitting in those cultures in that area. And this is a really weak argument from silence mostly, and I won't spend time on it. Um, let's look at Ephesians 5. This is going to take a ton of time to go through. Let me buckle up, prepare yourself, kick your brain on, get some more coffee, take a nap, go on a walk, maybe just go watch SpongeBob SquarePants, and then come back. Maybe. All right, Ephesians 5, verses 21 through 36. I'm going to focus on the work of Dr. Craig Keener here. This is Dr. Craig Keener. I personally love Dr. Craig Keener. Like... <laughs> I genuinely love this man. Um, his attitude, his his heart, like from what I can tell at a distance, I mean, his, the joy of the Lord, his willingness and desire to represent Christ. He's done a lot of scholarly work. He's a, he's a highly regarded egalitarian scholar, but that's not his focus isn't just egalitarian stuff. He's a brilliant and accomplished scholar, no sarcasm. He truly is. Um, his Bible background commentary on the New Testament, I find really valuable, although I don't agree with everything, but I find it very valuable and it shows his deep insight into the ancient culture, the Jewish and Roman culture of the time. This is pretty, he's, he, he knows his stuff, right? He's also a wonderful brother in Christ from all that I can tell. Um, anyway, I say this because I'm going to be disagreeing with him a bunch and I, I feel bad. I, I'm, I'm just being honest with you guys as a human. I feel bad because I, I look up to Dr. Keener as one of the guys I really respect, care about. So I apologize. Dr. Keener, if you have a chance to watch this, I already, I didn't even have to say any of that because I know you enough to know that you would just, you would take everything the right way because you're, you're, you impress me with that skill of yours. Okay. Um, let's, oh, we're going to look at his book, by the way. Um, in his book, Paul, Women and Wives, I have quoted from it several times in this series, but here I'm going to deal with it in more detail because he deals with Ephesians 5 in great detail. He gives a ton of time to it. Let me show you guys. He says <clears throat> in uh, Paul, Women and Wives, because Ephesians 5, 18 through 6, 9, is the longest passage in the New Testament addressing household roles. And because most elements of other passages are found here, we've devoted the second half of the book to an in-depth analysis of this passage. Now, I've read through and tried to like work through impo important points that I thought were worth bringing up to you guys. So this is good. Craig Keener will do a much more in-depth treatment than most others will. Most people have a chapter on it or part of a chapter on the topic. So I'm focusing on... Craig Keener's analysis, analysis of Ephesians 5, but other egalitarians say the same stuff, right? Not, not as much detail, but they'll say many of the same things. And I'll sprinkle in some other scholars as well, including Philip Payne and I, uh, is it Belleville or I don't know. We'll see. I forget who, <laughs> I don't know what's going on. All right. The final reason why I did Keener uh, is because I asked you guys a while back in a Facebook post, like what egal egalitarian scholars have you personally found very influential and N.T. Wright was one of them, so I included some of his work previously. Craig Keener is also one of them. And so I want to make sure I'm not only addressing people who I think are influencing scholarship in general, but people who are inf influencing people in general, and so it covers all the bases. So Keener's case, here's his case on Ephesians 5. It will depend on saying that the social setting of Ephesians explains elements people have mistakenly come to think are God's commands for all marriages. Here we go. The question that this chapter on social settings addresses is, 
Why does Paul, who calls for mutual submission, we'll get into this in detail, mutual submission, deal more explicitly with the submission of wives than with, the, with that of husbands? The answer this chapter proposes, in short, is because he was smart. His social statements are among the most progressive of his day, but if he wanted the gospel to gain a strong hearing in the Greco-Roman world, he needed to temper his radicalism with prudent sensitivity to his culture. So there's two main elements in this, and, and he explains this in more paragraphs. You could check it out in his book yourself if you like. Um, the, the two main elements of Keener's interpretation are all going to hang, I think, on these two things. One, the concept of mutual submission. That what Paul really requires is mutual submission. Everybody submits to everybody. Husband, wife, you both submit. Husbands submit too. Therefore, there's no, and this is the key part, there's no power imbalance in marriage. This is why I say, by submission, I mean a power imbalance. Because egalitarians will say, some of them will say, hey, but we, of course there's submission. It's mutual submission, right? But that, that would be no power imbalance. They both submit to each other. This is an extremely popular view in amongst egalitarians. You will see the term mutual submission everywhere. The second point that Keener will, will depend on for his thing, which is what he talks about in the second part of this quote, is what I, what I have come to call cultural bowing. The idea that whatever looks like it's implying unequal submission in, in the scriptures here, it's only meant for some people in special cultural circumstances. In other words, hey, if you're in Greco-Roman culture, if you're in Ephesus, yeah, you do that. But if you're in somewhere else, you're in modern um, Portland, Oregon, then it applies differently. You don't have to do that. There's an alternate view of, of, of cultural bowing, and sometimes scholars will argue for both, that says, and Keener argues for this, um, the reason why he wrote stuff that looked like wives would submit was because he wanted to make the Romans think that Paul wanted women to submit unequally to husbands, even though Paul really didn't want that, he just wanted to make the Romans think that. This seems to be one of Craig Keener's views, and I, I think it's got some significant issues with it, I'm sad to say. So Keener's case will depend on whether he can prove these two things, mutual submission and cultural bowing. Is mutual submission really what Ephesians is teaching, and is cultural bowing, bowing in one of those two senses, a real present element in Ephesians 5? So he starts by examining the culture of the time. Keep in mind, the point here is to say that if we understand the culture, We'll see the passage does not mean what complementarians have thought it means. That wives in general are supposed to submit to their husband's leadership. That's not what it means. If you knew the culture, you would understand this. And I know some are going to say, Mike, wait, are they arguing that it's telling wives submit and it's uneven authority or that it's not really saying that at all? Which one are they arguing? And, and really, a lot of egalitarians and Keener included are used for both. I know that's confusing, but they're not my arguments. So I'm just, I'm just telling you. Okay. In Craig Keener's um, next quote, we have the following. He's going to try here to establish that in the culture of the time, the Romans were basically afraid of the idea of the advancement of women in their societies. The Roman aristocracy felt their power base increasingly threatened by social changes occurring around them. These changes included the upward mobility of socially inferior elements, such as former slaves, foreigners, and women. Foreign religions were sometimes suspected of aiding what the aristocrats viewed as a subversion of the appropriate moral order. Do you get the idea here? Okay, we're, we're getting cultural setting that changes the way that you might approach your understanding of Ephesians. Let's go to the next one. Here he says, the gains of women in ancient society had introduced new tensions into Greco-Roman life in general, and probably into some marriages as well. I'm, I'm adding, notice I've highlighted words like maybe, probably, sometimes, could have. A lot of this case is going to really depend on a lot of these maybes, and that's a bit unfortunate for the case. Um, so probably into some marriages as well, due to the greater flexibility of possible role expectations now available. This meant that religions that were thought to ignore traditional roles for women would be viewed as threatening by the conservative male establishment. Um, one strange thing to me is that this upward mobility of women 
when I've looked at other, other scholars talking about this, they would say that in Rome in particular, and Rome would be the ones who would most likely, you don't want to upset the Romans. In fact, that's what Keener's going to talk about later. He goes, you don't want to accept the people in Rome. The people in Rome are making policy, right? You don't want to upset them. Um, but in Rome, it was the advancement of women was faster than it was in other parts of the empire. And so this seems strange. Like, is it really seen as that much of a threat when it's happening more in Rome? And I'm not really sure how to parse all that out. I'm just throwing it out there for you guys. So several steps are then made by Craig Keener. Um, I'm going to summarize them briefly because, again, he writes half the book is on this topic. So I have to summarize. But as I understand them, the first one is this, something called household codes. Um, when Paul writes, husbands this, wives that, children this, parents that, slaves this, masters that, there's three pairs of groupings, husbands, wives, children, parents, slaves, masters. Those are called household codes. So he's saying household codes, that kind of genre of writing was seen as central to society in Roman cultural, in Roman culture. Now there's some pushback to this. They do seem pretty central to Roman culture, but my pushback on this point would be, I think they're central in all cultures. Um, even the egalitarians think they're central and they would view the complementarians as a threat to a central element in society, right? So everybody sees them as culture, as central. Um, I don't know that the, this is a special thing with the Romans. Uh, number two, though, is that foreign religions might have been accused of violating those codes and undermining the culture, the power of men being undermined. So household codes are a big deal. Number two, in that time, foreign religions, big, big word, might have been accused of violating those important codes. Okay, maybe, but maybe doesn't get us that far. I haven't heard any examples of such accusations coming at Christians or even many other ancient religions. Like where's the examples of all these Romans complaining so much about um, this particular religion is subverting the moral order of the home. Where are those complaints? They don't seem very plentiful as far as I can tell. There's no real strong case for that. So this is a big maybe but it seems like a maybe in the silence. Number three, his case is also based on that some groups might have written household codes as a way of avoiding that very suspicion. Hey, household codes are important. We are, we might get mad at you if you don't support our household codes. And three, let's say a group like the, the Bogobians, <laughs> which is not a real group. And they go, hey guys, the Romans are getting mad at us. They think we're messing with the household codes. Let's write our own household codes just to make them think that we actually do hold to their views so they won't come after us. This is a big, 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 big maybe. We got from, yeah, true, to maybe, to m -m -m maybe. So some groups might have written this stuff. And did here's a question we have to ask. Let's suppose that the Bogobians did write household codes. Would they write codes they don't agree with and send them to each other and not to Rome, like Paul did? Um, that seems not unlikely. Um, one possible example, though, that Keener uses is Josephus. And he says, here's an example of someone showing their household codes to defend their faith. Now, Josephus is a Jew. He's, he's a Roman historian, but he's also Jewish. And he writes a book called Against Appion or Contra Appion. And in, in these books, he, um, book two, paragraph 201, right? In this book, he gives... Uh, a case for what the Jewish codes for homes are like. Craig Keener uses this as an example of someone writing a household code to defend their religion. This is important because it's the only example, or at least, at least, yeah, the only strong example I've seen of this. Um, and to quote it from Keener, let's examine this example. In fact, Josephus follows the three-part household code pattern in his defense of Judaism against Appion, one of its slanderers. But the text of Josephus, when you look it up, it doesn't support the egalitarian interpretation that Keener has. And I know I'm probably losing people here. This stuff gets complicated. Look, it's not my fault. Complementarians are simple. Egalitarians are radically complicated. <laughs> There's a reason for that because, well, you know. All right. Um... For says the scripture, here's Josephus. Now, I don't agree with what he says about the scripture here exactly, but look at what he writes. For says the scripture, a woman is inferior to her husband in all things. Let her therefore be obedient to him, not so that he should abuse her, but that she may acknowledge her duty to her husband, for God hath given, her, given the authority to the husband. 
Is Josephus an example of someone writing a household code they don't believe in to get the Romans to think that they're submitting to Roman standards? Or is Josephus an example of someone writing a household code because it's important and relevant in the moment, maybe even to defend Judaism, but it's a code that he 100% believes in? That's the thing. I think Paul believes in the code that he writes in Ephesians 5. So here he says, yeah, a, a women's, women's roles, they're inferior to her husband in all things. Let her be obedient. Not so he should abuse her. Even he doesn't want to see abuse happening. But that she may acknowledge her duty to her husband, for God hath given the authority to the husband. This was, this was he didn't change Jewish codes. He just wrote them down in response to accusations. So even if Ephesians involves Paul writing things down to respond to accusations, it doesn't mean he doesn't believe those things to be the case. And when he grounds them in Jesus and the church and the creation order of man and woman become one, it's just like Josephus grounding it in, he says, like the scripture has says, God made him. Although Josephus misquotes the Bible, but that's not the only time Josephus does that. So then finally, the fourth case, and this is where you get to the meat of Craig Keener's argument, is that, hey, yeah, household codes are important. They might be seen as a threat if you didn't, if you disrupted those codes. Um, you might have written your codes down in response to that possible issue to make sure you didn't look threatening to Rome. And finally, maybe that's what Paul did in Ephesians. Again, I'll say this is a big, big maybe. Several things are well established in chapter four of Keener's book on this sort of like cultural side. One, household codes were real. Number two, they really were often grouped in the same way Paul does. At least a, a number of times they're grouped this way. Husbands and wives group, parent-child grouped, master-slave grouped. But key parts of the case for, for cultural bowing are a chain with a lot of links that say maybe, and the maybes get bigger and bigger as you go. Here, recap some of the maybes. One, maybe Paul would write a household code to look like it fit with patriarchal views when it didn't really fit with those views. That's, to my knowledge, Craig Keener, this is, this is your view, right? Dr. Keener, he wrote it to look like it fits with patriarchal views, but it really doesn't. And the Romans were supposed to believe one thing about it, and the Christians were supposed to believe a different one. That's number two, right? The Paul here supposedly would instruct Christians in a letter to Christians written to Ephesus with an elaborate and hard to decipher household code that Christians were supposed to interpret as mutual submission and pagans were supposed to interpret as wifely submission. Number three issue, that we can jump from the idea that a religion might be criticized for undermining household structure to the idea that this was a pressing concern for Christians and for Paul in the first century who were regularly accused of undermining society by rejecting idolatry. That was the pressing issue, another central aspect of the community, as far as the Romans were considered, uh, were concerned. So it's much simpler to say that Paul, it, it doesn't have to be complicated, right? Paul's just telling people in Ephesians 5, this is how Christians view things. It's not so complicated. It, it, this thing gets crazy complicated. Let me share with you a longer quote from Dr. Keener to explain his view on this. This is going to be three clips for you to get his whole view here. Here's his conclusion of chapter four that kind of summarizes all of his points. By adhering to certain societal standards, the early Christians could perhaps hope to distinguish themselves from traditional objects of Roman slander, undignified Eastern Mediterranean religions, including such mysteries as the cult of Dionysus. This is not to suggest that Ephesians 5, 18 through 6, 9 is to be read as a direct defense of Christianity to Roman readership in the way that Josephus' tract against Appion defends Judaism against the charges of its opponents. After all, this letter was no doubt sent to Asia, not to Rome. Further, it was addressed to Christians, not to the opponents of Christianity. Good points, I would say. But by encouraging Christians to live in a way that would silence some of the needless objections raised against the faith, as he has done in his previous letters, Paul was contributing to a cultural defense of Christianity that would hopefully gain a better hearing in a Roman society. When he had written to the Romans, he had encouraged their support of civil authorities. Keep that in mind. I'm going to respond to this in a moment. Now that he himself was in Rome, the issue that would be would contribute to a lifestyle defense of Christianity had no doubt become even clearer to him. There is thus reason to think that Paul, awaiting trial in Rome, 
would have been co contemplating strategies to appeal to the power brokers in Rome whose decisions could set precedents for policies towards Christians elsewhere in the empire. His household codes may represent a long-range response to basic Roman cultural objections to the gospel. Stressing the wife's submission would be important for evangelizing. And he goes on, but I think you guys understand his point, his conclusions. So, is are are, are we saying here? And I don't know. I don't actually know for sure what, what Keener is saying here in this regard. That Ephesians is teaching wives to submit, Roman style, to defend the church against Rome, or he's teaching. Mutual submission, egalitarian style, which would have greatly offended the Romans. Most egalitarians will tell me that Ephesians 5 says mutual submission, not wives submit. Craig Keener seems like he's on that side, but then he also says, but he wrote it this way, so the Romans, I, I think I think there's problems there. But, but let me offer some other pushback that's more, <clears throat> I think, fundamental for the case. We need to ask how much Paul was actually concerned about avoiding imperial persecution because of teaching things that would trigger Rome. Because I don't know that he was that worried about it. In what ways, here's a question we can ask <clears throat> that gives us an example of Paul's attitude towards being persecuted for misunderstandings. In what ways did Paul incite persecution during his ministry? Well, for one, he openly called for the people everywhere he went to cast out their idols and empty out the, the pagan temples. This was a huge, huge deal. In Acts chapter 19, Paul's in Ephesus. Like the Romans, they saw this, we know, maybe more so than the household issue, saw this as a huge affront to their whole culture and their system of doing things. But when Paul was in Ephesus in Acts 19, in the same context as the letter to the Ephesians, there he's getting hard pushback from people threatened by the removal of idols from the homes of Christians. Right, The temple of Artemis is there, the idol-making businesses are there, and the overall political power of the city is connected to these idolatrous religions, and so it feels like their political power is under threat. Right? They're going to make our city look bad. They're going to shrink the power of our culture if they get rid of the worship of Artemis. Paul doesn't care. He will not stop. Idolatry was an integral part of city and state politics. A known threat to idolatry was Christianity, and Paul didn't make any space for that at all. Even though it would bring out imperial persecution at some points, he didn't care. Let's look at what he did in Athens um, in Acts 17. I'm just saying Paul Paul's not that strategic <laughs> when it comes to the, in that style. He doesn't normally do the thing that Keener suggests he's doing here. Being then God's offspring, he says to the pagans, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. Then he calls it ignorance that they've been worshiping idols. This times of ignorance God has overlooked. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he's going to judge y'all. He does the classic like turn or burn thing. And he does this with, with fully well knowing that it could cause persecution. And it did cause real persecution. In the first century, uh, well, I, I guess it's early second century, we have letters um, between Emperor Trajan and Pliny, who was like a governor for Rome. And Trajan had called for the persecution of Christians because one of the issues is people aren't buying idols anymore and the temples are losing their power and this hurts the power of our empire and our political strength. And so Pliny had been instructed by Emperor Trajan to persecute Christianity to restore the supremacy of the approved Roman idol worship. What I'm saying is, here's a known threat to Christianity, unlike household codes, not really known, just a big maybe. Um, and in that, Paul does not pull punches at all. He doesn't write in special ways that makes the Romans think idols, idols are okay, but then the Christians know it's not. Or he's no strategy here except telling all men everywhere to repent. Then he writes Ephesians, and it's this super like ninja, like kung fu style Christians mutual submission, Romans wives submit. You know, it doesn't make sense to me. I don't understand this point. It's just too much to assume that Paul is doing what he's doing because um, of a fear of persecution when he never does that anywhere else, to my knowledge. <clears throat> and you can see that Craig Keener understood some of this in his book because here he writes, the turning of a wife from her husband's religion was viewed as an especially subversive ploy on the part of foreign religions. Okay, here's, a, here's the thing that 
Craig Keener says, look, here's something that Romans would get upset about. Trying to get wives to have different religions than their husbands. Plutarch, Keener says, emphasizes the importance of the wife, the wife's worship, her husband importance of the wife's worshiping her husband's gods. A wife ought not to make friends on her own, but to enjoy her husband friends in common with him. The gods are the first and most important friends. Wherefore, it is becoming for a wife to worship and know only the gods that her husband believes in. And to shut the front door tight on all queer rituals and outlandish superstitions. So it would definitely rise the, raise the ire of Romans for Christian women to have non-Christian husbands. But they still evangelized women, and the church didn't stop if their husband was not a Christian, right? See 1 Peter 3. Even if your husband's not a Christian, you still be faithful to Jesus. Paul seems okay with persecution if it rises from an accurate understanding of Christian teaching. I don't know any place where he avoids that. The Romans thought Christianity in addition. Here's a whole other point. That I present like a run-on sentence, sorry. Okay, the Romans, in addition, they thought Christianity was Jewish. They didn't recognize, at the time, Christianity as a new and separate religion. They thought it was Judaism. They thought that these were just a bunch of Jews. They thought these, these, these Gentiles were just converting to Judaism. They didn't understand Christianity very well. So the Jews had a known household order that fit Roman culture in many ways. So there was no big dilemma going on at the time about what were these, what's the household order of the Christians? It was more like, what do you say about our idols? That was the real issue. It seems unlikely that this, this, this household code order would ever have been an issue in the Christian church in the way that it would, it would have to be for Keter's theory to hold. When Paul did write about doing things for the sake of witness, he didn't, and here's another point, he never wrote about it the way he does in Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5 just sounds like instructions for every Christian. It just sounds like straightforward instructions, not super, you know, deep kung fu. But when he did write, I want you to do this for the sake of witness for others, he was very different. Let me read an example. This is 1 Corinthians 9.20. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. That's for evangelism, purely for evangelism. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. So he, whenever he was around the Jews, he observed all the laws, all the, all the practices they were expecting of him as a way of evangelizing them. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. So to the Gentiles, when he's with Gentiles, he's not worried about what he's eating, um, days of the week, things like that. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I've become all things to all people, that by all things I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I might share with them in its blessings. Now, some of Galatians will quote this as evidence that Paul is counseling what he counsels about marriage purely for evangelistic purposes. But this is to hijack one verse and, and cram it on top of another, and, and that's not how we should do Bible study. My point is this. All these issues, Sabbath observance, what kind of meat you can eat, whether you need to observe the law in its entirety and be under the law of Moses, these are all things where Paul says, I will do them for the sake of evangelism, but at the same time, and here's the key element, he clearly, elsewhere, clearly taught these things were not binding upon any Christian. That's how Paul handles the evangelism issues. But when it comes to Ephesians 5, he's like, hey, every Christian, this is how marriage works. That's it, end of story. He doesn't say, in Christ, it doesn't matter who submits. We both submit. It doesn't make any difference. But for the sake of reaching the Romans, like it'd be easy for Paul to write Ephesians that way. He could just say, for the sake of reaching people, you know, in, in our culture, let's let's follow their traditions that we might evangelize them the better. Like he never says any of that in Ephesians. It's just um, different than Paul's normal style. There's some remaining issues before we get on to some more of uh, Craig Keener's case. Um, These are things that Craig Keener mentioned briefly. Um, this is why it doesn't make sense to think of Ephesians 5 as having anything to do with Roman attitudes about Christians. Um, it was not written to Rome. It was not written to non-believers. It was not written with any indication of 
if they ask you, if non-believers ask you about household codes, tell them this. It didn't say that. Um, it's not like the issues with meat and fasting where he says, you can do this and you have liberty, but for the sake of witness or conscience, you can do this. That's not, that's not present in Ephesians 5. If those rules were written for apologetic purposes, why assume, even if, he, even if he did write it for the sake of those things, even though I don't think there's any evidence of it, why would we assume that it doesn't also represent genuine Christian beliefs about household codes? That's what Josephus did, right? He wrote in defense of, of Jews, but he wrote what Jews really believed about marriage. He didn't make stuff up. There's no kung fu going on there. What Paul says to husbands, this is another point, isn't even Roman in culture. Husbands, love your wife self-sacrificially as Christ loved the church. This is not Roman culture. That's not typical Roman household code. So, yeah, it doesn't make sense. Like, egalitarians think that the part to wives, that's that's cultural sometimes. Or, it's, or it doesn't count. Like, it doesn't mean that. We'll talk more about mutual submission in a second. Um, but then the part to husbands is always binding in all cultures for all time. And that... Is strange, and that doesn't fit Roman household codes. So, if this was a defense for the Romans, why does it not fit their codes in the first place? It, it it all just seems weird. So, there are specific indicators. Excuse me, there are not, <laughs> there are not specific indicators in Ephesians five that this is a transcultural, uh, or a. Oh, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I just got lost in my own notes. You guys, I I I apologize. I should be a better teacher than this. <laughs> I truly should. <laughs> Yeah, I, you can blame me all day long. Okay, it's just, this is going to be the longest video in the entire series probably, so forgive me for that. Um, um, are there specific indicators in Ephesians 5, in Ephesians 5, specific indicators where you see in the passage itself, not just in the culture outside, but in the passage itself, you can look at the verses that show us that this is either a transcultural principle or that it's cultural bowing. Which one is it? I think the answer is that there aren't any indicators that it's cultural bowing and there may be indicators that it's transcultural because it grounds it in creation and in the relationship of Christ in the church, right? For the two shall become one, the husband is the head, that's the nature of marriage, right? which is which is not something that was commonly stated, to my knowledge, by the Romans. And then in redemption, wives submit to your husbands as, as, as the church submits to Christ. Wives, you're the body, he's the head. Church, you're the body, he's the head. This is not, this is not about culture. It's about honoring Christ. Let's go to the next quote from Dr. Keener. He says, but for the sake of their witness and their survival, this is where it gets complicated. Paul portrayed Christian ethics in terms that would best communicate their culture to their culture, the moral superiority of Christianity. This is what, from what I can follow in Dr. Keener, Dr. Keener's work, this starts to set things up for a very nuanced interpretation of Ephesians 5. I've mentioned it pre briefly, but Paul seems to, according to Keener, simultaneously he echoes Roman expectations for marriage, which means the guy's in charge, right? Um, but this is purely for the survival of Christianity. That, that claim has not been proven, but that's in there. Yet, within that, Paul's actually sharing Christian ethics that are different than the Roman ethics that he makes it look like he's sharing. To me, this sounds like it, it, it could turn into this weird case where the Christians, here's the secret info, you know, and then Romans like, yeah, that's why I submit, you know, go Rome. Um, yeah, we need clear exegetical study to prove these things. This is getting into strange territory, in my opinion. I, I, I hate to say it. So here we shift to the verse by verse stuff. Now we go to Ephesians 5 verse by verse. This is where we get to see how um, the egalitarians interpret not just the culture, I dealt with the culture and, and are we seeing rel remnants of the culture and, and fears of persecution and all this in Ephesians 5. Now we're gonna look at the verse by verse stuff. So here we go, Dr. Keener on this. Paul avoids the nuances in Ephesians 5, of obedience and ruling, but he does not mind calling on wives to submit or husbands to love because this was the behavior that should indeed characterize all Christians. Let's talk about what this quote means because it's how an egalitarian might interpret wives submit to your husbands. They'll first say something like, look, notice the words Paul doesn't use. 
obey, obey or rule, obedience or ruling. He never uses those words. Keener interprets this as Paul's avoiding those words. That's different, right? Um, like, notice that Paul avoided the word horse while he was talking about wives and husbands. He really avoided the word horse, didn't he? Like, I could just say he avoids any word I want, but I could be missing out because did I expect him to use that word? Did he need to use that word to communicate something? Is there a clear indication of why the word missing, obedi obedience and ruling is missing, is important? So it's not just that Paul didn't use the word obey for wives or rule for husbands, but he avoided those terms for a specific reason because all Christians, according to Keener, are to submit to each other and to love each other. This implies that there's nothing unequal or truly different between what a husband or wife is called to do because they're both called to love and they're both called to submit. The love and submit language, this is key, is just to make it palatable to Romans. So when you go to Ephesians 5, and you get to verse 21, the beginning of the section, right? Really, I mean, it, or it connects at least. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And they'll say, guys, the Galatians, look, husbands and wives, everyone submits to everyone. Submit to one another. They don't take it as meaning, hey, every, everyone you have someone to submit to, but rather everyone you have everyone to submit to. That's an important interpretation point. Then they'll say, so wives submit to your husbands. Well, that's just what everyone's doing. So the husband also submits. Husbands love your wives. Well, but so why everyone's called to love everyone. Everyone do everything for everyone. That's the interpretation, the one egalitarian interpretation of this passage. This interpretation, though, uh, from Dr. Keener, even though it only says for wives to submit and only says for husbands love, um, it has um, Paul writing two different things to two different groups of people. And I've mentioned this before. I'll mention it again because I think it's a key issue. Romans, I want you to think that wives submit Christians, I want you to think there are no role differences relating to authority in marriage because everyone submits and everyone loves. It's a strange interpretation of scripture that it was written in such a strange way. Why is it that most Christians throughout time have interpreted it the way the Romans were supposed to be misled to think it meant? Um, instead of the way that Paul actually meant it for Christians. That, that seems like a strange thing. So mutual submission is the big key. Now we get to mutual submission. Finally, we're there. This is, this is where it's all at. This is where every Galatarian I've ever heard talk about Ephesians says mutual submission. So it's, it, in other words, this is a very relevant issue. Interestingly, they say, this is Dr. Keener, when Paul calls on wives to submit in Ephesians 5.22, he presents this as a particular example of the submission of all believers to one another. He goes on. Um, wait, did I? Uh, Paul uses the traditional form of household codes discussed above, but by grounding the wife's submission in general, Christian submission, he qualifies the meaning of those codes. Yes, the wife should submit to her husband, but the husband, following Christ's example of self-sacrificial service for his wife, also must submit to his wife. So this is different than, than the egalitarian saying um, a husband doesn't have to submit at all. Um, don't know why that's not working now. Uh-oh. Because I've been going on for too long, maybe. Um, da, 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 da. Just do that. Okay, um, it's different than saying wives don't submit. What they're saying is it doesn't mean much when it says wives submit because husbands submit too. So it has no relationship to authority. So where does Craig Keener find husbands submitting? It's found in two places. It's found in the idea that if Christ loved the church, then husbands loving their wives means they submit to them. So the Christ example equals submission. And the other is that verse 21 means that husbands also submit to their wives because verse 21 has mutual submission. I don't know why. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to get my, my stuff to work. Okay, at least some of it works. Um, okay. For those who are like, Mike, why do you do this live? Why do you go live when you could just record and edit the videos and do all this? That would greatly increase the amount of labor I have to put into the content. I do a lot of this work myself alone, by myself. So 
you can live through a little bit of it not being perfect. <laughs> it's not the end of the world. Um, so verse 21 says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Let's talk a little bit about that. So if you're going to be consistent, if you're going to take these views consistently, then you have to remember there's three groups of people. There's husbands and wives, Christ and the church. Um, they're related, sorry, one group really. Husbands and wives, parents and children, masters and slaves. And if you take the rule that verse 21, it means everyone submits to everyone, then any instruction here where it says husbands, right? Wives submit to your husbands, husbands love. Children obey your parents, right? Parents don't, don't provoke them to wrath. Train them in the ways of the Lord. Masters obey, or slaves, sorry, obey your masters and masters, right? Don't, don't threaten them. Don't be, don't be wrong or mean or cruel to them or treat them as less than fully valuable people. Um, what you're going to have to do is say that all three of these are equaled out. This means that if husbands have to submit to their wives, then children have to submit to their parents along with parents submitting to their children. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Are masters supposed to submit to their to their servants, their slaves? Is that what Paul is saying in Ephesians? No, because the the verse, the Ephesians five passage, just doesn't. It never meant that to anybody at the time. Submitting to one another doesn't mean every individual submits equally to every other individual. What happens in this passage is Paul says submitting to one another, and then he gives three examples of unequal submission. Husbands and wives, parents and children, slaves and masters. And he calls them to do it out of reverence for Christ. This doesn't undo the imbalanced stuff that's going on. Wives are told to submit, husbands are not. And this is just seems to me to be an obviously, an obviously bad way of studying the Bible. I think it's, I don't want to be mean here, but I think that this perspective of verse 21, taking that and stretching it out as this sort of like umbrella to drop strangely onto the rest of the passage, doesn't recognize there's three groups of every one of them in imbalanced authority relationship, every single one. And unless you're going to say parents submit to their children in the, in the sense that a first century Christian would have thought wives submit to the, you know, and children submit that those things were relevant. I, I don't even know how, I don't, it's, I feel like you just, you're on your own <laughs> if you want to say that. Um, do parents submit to their children? You might say, in some ways they do, don't they, Mike? In some ways, parents submit to their children, and I'm going to argue, um, no, they don't. Parents clearly have authority, their children don't. That's the point. This mutual submission thing doesn't work. It doesn't remove authority between parents and children. Parents self-sacrificially meet the needs of their, their children, but they're still in charge. If they aren't in charge, something's actually wrong. First Timothy says that if an elder isn't in charge in his home, like of his children specifically, then he, he doesn't, isn't qualified to be an elder. If he, if he can't get his own children when they're kids, they're little, to submit, then how is he supposed to be able to manage the house of God? It's not going to work. Do slaves submit to their masters? Yes. Do masters submit to their slaves? No, no. Nobody thought that was happening. And the mutual submission thing doesn't change that. Like, this is a flowery but, but wrong interpretation of the passage. There's, there's uh, ultimately two ways that somebody could get a husband submitting to his wife out of Ephesians chapter 5. One of them is the comparison of Christ loving the church. I think that that fails strongly because when you bring Jesus and the church as the comparison of a husband and wife, you you just strengthen the idea that submission is real there because the church always submits to Christ. But Keener and other egalitarian scholars, they rely on the idea that Jesus loving us is him submitting to us because they think a husband loving his wife is him submitting to her. When it comes to authority, Jesus has never had less than all authority. He's always had the authority for the church. He never went to the disciples and was like, Peter, tell me, what is the agenda for our, for our lives? It, I mean, he never submits to the church. The church submits to him. It's the right relationship. Jesus's love doesn't equal Jesus's submission to us. Jesus submits to the Father. He does not submit to the church. The other way to get a husband submitting to his wife out of Ephesians 5 is to say that as already dealt with Ephesians 5.21 says it. Let's look here at a couple of quotes from Keener. It's clear that the submission of verse 22 cannot be other than the submission of verse 21 from the simple fact that the word submitting does not even appear in the Greek text of verse 22. It has to be borrowed from verse 21. 
it's perfectly legitimate to read verse 22, wives submit to your husbands, as long as we understand that we must take verse 22 as an example of verse 21's mutual submission. Indeed, one commentator points out that verse 22 might be translated, for example, wives to your husbands. And this is no doubt its force. Wives should submit to their husbands because Christians should submit to one another. And, and here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually agree. Um, we both agree wholeheartedly that mutual submission in verse 21, or people submitting to each other, is the, is the launch pad for the three groups that are mentioned in the later verses. But in no sense does that mean that these three groups have equal amounts of submission happening between them because everything else about the passage sh shows that they don't. So submit to one another does not mean every person equally submits to every single other person equally in all ways equally. Like you're just adding a lot to scripture to say that. Um, yeah, I'll just move forward. Now, the next in the next quote, Dr. Keener redefines the word submit. Um, so, so some of these things, they feel like they don't, they don't cohere, like some of these interpretations, like the, if you if you believe every interpretation you're getting from the Yaltarians, you actually have contradictory views. But but here's a different one, and <clears throat> this has to do with redefining the word submit. He says, Paul urges submission, but by placing it in the context of mutual submission, see above, he defines it quite differently than most of his culture did. Even at the risk of raising the charge of subversion he had worked so carefully to avoid, Paul does not call on wives to take charge of their husbands, but calls on husbands to love their wives in such a radical way that the husbands become their wives' servants too. Does radical love equal submission? Again, I just think this is an empty argument. Um, Jesus is the example in Ephesians, and it proves it. Jesus serves us, but he does not submit to us. He uses his authority to be a service to us, but he does not submit to us. Radical love does not equal submission. I think I think we can move forward. Um, here's the next. Um, yeah. Paul defines the husband's submission in much greater detail, however, and defines it in terms of Christ's self-sacrificial service on behalf of the church. So here, Keener suggests that Paul literally defines a husband's submission as self-sacrificial love, which would mean that theologically, Jesus submitted to you and me and the thief on the cross and everybody else. He submitted to them in authority when he was serving them it, it, because he loved them. It, again, I'm just, just, he's just making new definitions for words. I think we can move on. Notice though, in the previous quote, that he says that Paul defines the word, I highlighted this part, quite differently than most of his culture did. Anytime someone says, um, someone in the Bible is using a word that everybody in their culture would have understood this way, and they're using it in a totally different way, that's kind of a red flag. It's not that it can't be true, but you need really strong evidence to think that they're using the same word everyone else uses and using a new definition for that word. Catch that? That's, that's kind of important. Would that culture have understood? Here's the question. Would the culture in Paul's time have understood a command to love or even honor the wife as an indication of the husband's submission to the wife in a significant way that removes the authority imbalance in marriage? And I think the answer here is no. And for this, I'll quote the Talmud. So the Talmud, which is a Jewish source, um, which obviously the Jews had very strong feelings about there being authority differences in marriage. And here we go. They said, he who loves his wife as himself and honors her more than himself and teaches his sons and daughters honest ways. This is describing what the Talmud considers a good person. There's other sources that say similar things. Now, why am I bringing this up? Here's my point. If in that first century culture, they could consider, a, you know, at least some people, it wasn't super common, but at least some people thought, a husband really deeply loving, honoring his wife as himself, that this is a good thing. And they didn't interpret that to mean that the husband had no longer a higher authority in marriage. Then that means that when Paul writes to the Ephesians and says, wives submit, husbands love self-sacrificially, none of them would have thought this undid the higher authority that was implied through the submission language. There's another redefinition 
um, in Keener's interpretation, interpretation. So here we go, another redefinition of a term. Although he explicitly defines the wife's submission only as respect. This kind of hurts, okay? I, I, I highly respect and love Dr. Keener, but I think this is, this is, this is in, inexcusable, okay? And, and not, it's not like, oh, you're out of the body of Christ or something. It's just a significant mistake that, that shouldn't, we shouldn't overlook, okay? According to Dr. Keener, Paul redefined submission so that submission, when it relates to the husband, is love, and somehow love means submission. It, and that's a confusing circular thing um, that the culture would not have understood because look at the Talmud. But he also redefines the wife's submission. When it says wives submit, he defines that explicitly, not even implicitly, but explicitly as respect. In Ephesians 5.33, when Paul summarizes the instructions to wives and husbands, he says, husbands, love your wives, right? Wives, respect your husbands. Does that mean he is defining the word submission as only, only respect? No. Um, no, it doesn't. There's nothing r reasonable about saying that. Ephesians 5.33, it does say wives respect your husbands, but why did Paul ever write wives submit to your husbands earlier on and that husband's the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church and as the church submits to Christ, so wives ought to submit to their own husband. Well, why would he write all that if submission was only respect? Do you respect Jesus, but you don't submit to him? You don't obey him? No. Um, here's alternate views. Submission's involved in respect. Submission is part of respect in relation between a husband and wife. Respect is part of submission in this particular relationship. Basically, the two respect and submission are connected, but one does not become the new definition of the other. There's nothing in the scripture that indicates that. Why is, is Dr. Keener going through such great lengths to redefine submission? Because, remember his view, is that Paul is telling the Christians mutual submission, and then we're going to redefine that as love and respect, and it has, uh, there's no authority and balance. But he wants the Romans to think wives are submitting and we're observing normal patriarchal Roman views. So we're going to use a word that the Romans will interpret one way, but the careful-eyed theological Christians will interpret a different way, even though in history they didn't. Consider this passage from Dr. Keener and what you think it implies, and then I'm going to work through it a bit. I'm going to have to read it to you. I don't have, I, oh, no, no, I do have it. It's just over here. Yeah. All right. I'm sorry, guys. I'm trying. Um, okay. So Paul is certainly among the minority of ancient writers in that he devotes more space to the exhortation of husbands to love in Ephesians 5 than that of wives to submit. In our culture, his exhortation to, of two wives to submit stands out more strongly. In his culture, the exhortation to husbands to love rather than the normal advice to rule the home would have stood out more strongly. Now, I would say that that's actually true. All of that's true. But what can we learn from this observation? That's, that's where the debate's going to come in. Is it that Paul is going against his culture by reimagining the relationship of husband and wife as mutual submission in the egalitarian sense? No authority imbalance. Or is Paul re refocusing on how we prioritize our callings in that marriage? So it's not like their culture, but it's not like the egalitarians either. Paul's not saying something contrary to what the culture taught or thought, but he is saying something better, though it's consistent with that culture to, in, some, in some ways. Wives submit, but they're to do it as unto Christ. Husbands, your job isn't done when you've led your wife or ruled or whatever. Your job's done when you've loved her self-sacrificially as Christ has loved us. This seems to me to be the heart of complementarianism. We have different roles unequal in authority, but equal in value. And all of us are focused on serving Jesus in those roles. That's a beautiful marriage. Okay, if there's statistics on those marriages where husbands do that and wives do that, they're going to be good statistics. But it's not, it's, it's not Kung Fu. Um, Dr. Keener's basic view on Paul's call to wives and husbands is first, he recognizes that many in that time would have used stronger words than submit or respect. Fair enough. But does this undo the imbalanced authority relationship? No. It may soften the harshness of it. Maybe Paul did want to soften the harshness of husbands having authority because that does tend to be harsh. And maybe the Bible wants to soften the harshness of it, but not kill it entirely. This all requires 
Unfortunately, for Keener's view, for Ephesians 5 to be an extremely subtle but powerful passage, balancing authority in marriage because of the emphasis on husband's love, taking dominance in the passage, that, that's an important point. Paul gives this much space to husband's love, that much space to wives submit. Is the space, does that mean egalitarians are right? There's another passage from Paul that seems to prove this wrong, and it's Titus chapter 2, verses 3 through 10. So we're going to get into the scripture. Titus 2, verse 3. Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and here's how they train the young women. To love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, to be pure, working at home, kind, submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Look at the imbalance here. This is all training for the younger women. Here's the, here, here's the younger men, one verse. Um, here's another imbalanced passage. We have this much towards young men, young women who are married here, and this much towards young men, one verse. Should we draw big theological conclusions about that? I, I don't think so. I think that we're just being unfair here. We're, we're drawing, we're making mountains out of molehills in that sense. There's no careful balancing act here. It's just submit. It's just one side. Doesn't even talk about the younger men loving their wives in that passage. But Paul talks about it elsewhere, but he's not so worried about balancing everything out at every moment. Paul doesn't seem to be doing what Dr. Keener suggests. Wouldn't he have to do it in Titus 2 in order to avoid people thinking that there's an imbalanced submission? How is it that Titus just says, tell women to submit to their husbands? And it doesn't balance it out with, tell the young women to love, to young men to, to love self-sacrificially their wives and all the, and have, why doesn't it have to go on and on like it does in Ephesians? Because Paul taught both things everywhere and it wasn't this weird mess, internal messaging about a balancing act. I think that's the, I think that's the point. So Paul even uses submit for bond servants in the first Timothy passage. Actually, I could, maybe I should just leave it up for you. Um, he'll go on and he'll talk um, all the way through verse 10 about bond servants, and he says, be submissive. Same word, hupatasso. So hupatasso, he doesn't mean just respect. Like, he's like, yeah, yeah, you have to do, you know, do what they say. <laughs> That's kind of what he's saying. Now, I'm not talking about micromanaging. I already explained that earlier. But I think that it's showing that Paul's not using a special definition of the word. In other words, Paul would have to be having a special definition for submission in Ephesians that is not the same definition in Titus. But in Titus, he uses submission about wives as well. But maybe he means submit in one way and then submit in a different way. And it just gets way too complicated. And it's all different than the culture would. Um, again, in Titus 3.1, Paul uses submit again, uh, implying obedience within reason. When in Titus 3.1... Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient. He even describes submission as including a sense of obedience here. So why should we say that when Paul says submit, it means not obey? Like that's the part where it's just, it's all just, we're wasting our time with, with these arguments. I, I kid you not. I'm sorry I have to make such a long video about it. <laughs> um, but I have to because there's a whole massive Church is full of people who are caught up in these arguments that are not good and they don't know it because they've never really evaluated it. They just heard it and thought, yeah, that sounds well, that works good for me. I like that. Finally, um, there's the meaning of the Greek term. The word submit means, let me just quote BDAG, BDAG, the, probably one of the most authoritative New Testament Greek resources. It says that the word submit here means to cause to be in a submissive relationship, to subject, to subordinate. That's how Paul probably defines it, not as only respect. That's weird. I have some notes in my notes, uh, and I shrunk the font so I wouldn't teach through it there, but it's in my notes. If you guys catch those off the website, I'll put a link down below when I'm done. On Paul and his culture, there's a few things there I'll, 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 I'll have in the notes for you if you want. But let me just summarize here where Paul is different than his culture, because here's where we lose the baby with the bathwater. Paul is different than the Roman culture, but not in the egalitarian sense. I think he's different in the complementarian sense, as I've studied these things. One Here's how he's really different from his culture. He emphasizes love a lot more than the culture did. You can find a few quotes where they do, but it's certainly not typically anything like what Paul does. And even when they talk about loving, they don't do it in this example of Christ, right? Paul emphasizes love a lot more and an incredibly high standard of love. 
You're to love your wife as your own body, self-sacrificially. You're to lay yourself down for her, okay? cherishing her, nourishing her as Christ does the church. That's huge. Number two, here's how Paul is different than his culture. He never tells husbands to force their wives to submit. It's not on them. Here's another quote. This, this is from Dr. Keener, and I agree with it, right? There's no talk about the husband's authority or a female's inferior ontological... Oh, that's the wrong one. That is not from Keener. That's Lynn Kohick, different quote I shared earlier. Paul does not address the husband's role in the wife's submission. He does not urge the husband to inculcate submission in his wife. Husbands, it is not your job to quote the Bible at your wife all the time whenever she disagrees with you. That is not your job. Like, your job is love her. Her task is submit, but it's not your job to make her do her job. And the minute in marriage where you make it your job to make them do their job, you are headed down a scary path with like spikes and thorns and thistles and briars and monsters and weird slippery goo and all kinds of like acid rain flowing down from the sky. Like this is bad news. Do not focus on what they need to do. Focus on what you need to do. That's the emphasis of Ephesians, unlike the culture of the time. Number three, Paul's different than his culture in this. Paul says it's all about Christ. Okay, the culture didn't care one lick about Christ. Wives, you're to submit as unto Christ. Husbands, you're to love as Christ loved the church. This inspires and strengthens marriage. There is always a motive to do your part fully, even when they're totally not doing their part, because you're looking to your Savior who did everything fully when you did nothing who loved you when you were yet sinners, died for you. You're, you're seeing him, and so there's always motive to do what's right. That is totally different than the culture of the time. And number four, Paul addresses each rule to the person doing the rule. Right? This is similar to how he doesn't tell a husband, make your wife submit, or a wife, make your husband love. But in addition to that, he only addresses the rule to the person doing the rule. More often than not, though not always, in the ancient household codes, a Man is told what the man and the woman should do, but not, not here. Not here. It's the woman who's told what the woman should do. The man who's told what the man should do. Children who are told what the children should do. Parents what the parents should do. Masters what they should do. Slaves what they should do. There's a strong Christian principle of taking full responsibility for your own part in any relationship or any duty that you have and not obsessing over what everyone else should be doing to the detriment of your own responsibilities. Okay, that's how Paul's different than his culture, but this is the important part that I think egalitarians miss. This is how Paul is not different from his culture. He says, wives submit. Nobody there was confused about what Paul meant. Nobody. Today, they are, but that's just today, right? We're, we're, we're the ones with the weird culture. Everyone would have taken that to mean an imbalanced authority relationship between husbands and wives. And we are not wise to interpret things to mean something totally different than the obvious meaning to the original audience. That's a hermeneutic principle. It's one thing if the original audience would have scratched their head and been like, I don't know what that means. Maybe one day we'll figure it out. Maybe we'll have more insight than they did. But if they all knew exactly what it meant, and we all know it means something totally different than what they all knew it meant, we're probably wrong. Number two, how Paul's not different than Roman culture. He thinks love is of supreme importance, right? They thought this, this too, that love was really important. Like, surprise, surprise, they really did think this. And there's a lot of Weird literature written on this nowadays, but they did think love was important, contrary to some people's claims. And some scholars complain about this. They go, they act like nobody cared about love in marriage back in the day, but that's not true when you look at the sources. One problem is that our culture sometimes sees romantic love as an involuntary gut thing, right? But the Bible issues love as a command, something you just have to do. And we focus on this, but I just feel like I'm not in love anymore. And I'm like, dude, walk in love. Don't be like, I'm in love now. I don't know. It just happened. It's like, no, you walk in love, behave in love. That's a different perspective. Um, and three, Paul taught husbands should not abuse their wives. Did you know the culture taught that as well? In a lot of places too. There were all, there are some people in the culture that thought it was okay for a husband to be abusive, but it was not the widespread teaching of the moralists and the ethicists and stuff like that. Many did not. This was not just brand new to Paul. Now he elevates it even beyond that. But that is actually not a new view. Okay, I got to deal briefly with an alternative egalitarian view before we get to the slavery, the big slavery objection that's coming up. An alternative egalitarian view is that maybe Paul did mean to support authority imbalance 
So we read Ephesians 5. It's not this mutual submission thing. It's like, no, wives submit, husbands love, but you are. There is an imbalance in authority. Maybe Paul did mean that, but he didn't mean for it to be transcultural. This is another view that Craig Keener sort of holds. Now, it seems to me it's in conflict with his other interpretations. And so I don't know what's happening. It's like we're throwing spaghetti against the wall to see what'll stick. Um, but here's a quote. Um, when Paul writes in Ephesians, Paul's responding to a specific cultural issue for the sake of the gospel and his words should not be taken at face value in all cultures, right? Because face value would imply, I, I don't know, I still don't know. Is it, does face value imply mutual submission or does face value imply authority imbalance? Because if I don't take it at face value, then it must be that it supports the complementarian view. <laughs> but if it says mutual submission, then why am I not taking it at face value? I, I don't know. These, these are mutually contradictory interpretations as far as I can tell. Um... So many egalitarians, though, will hold this view that Paul did mean to say wives submit, and that's an imbalance in authority, but that it was only for a local culture, a local time. Um, for this, the pro, the case you can make for this would be, hey, they expected a wife to submit, and they would be upset if Christians taught otherwise. And that's probably true. And that's it. That's the whole case for it. I, I don't know of any case that shows that Christians did teach otherwise. That, I, I, I mean, if if Christians taught that um, you could only eat by shoving things up your nose, it would probably make the culture around them pretty upset. Does that mean that that's the reason why Christians didn't teach you can only eat by shoving things up your nose? No, like this is, it's just assuming the conclusion to say that. So there's not much for this. Against this view, I'll list several things. Ephesians doesn't have language in it that says it was for the culture, but that it was tied to gospel-related issues, Christ in the church, and creation. That's not for culture. And then Titus 2, verses 1 through 6, which I've read earlier, but they, this bears down on this really dramatically, because Titus 2 gives us a test case where Paul actually does talk about a cultural issue related to wives submitting. Look at this. It says right here that um, they should train the younger women to submit to their own husbands that the word of God may not be reviled. That looks like, hey, that's for culture, right? Is it really though? Because this is a test case. So if, if Paul, who clearly brings up outside attitudes about the word of God, culture, if he meant that wife submission was only for that purpose and it's not transcultural, this would be this would be the the way he would say it, right? But there's a bunch of things that are listed for that reason that the word of God may not be reviled. Let's look at some of them. Backing up, teach what accords with sound doctrine. That is, of course, the overarching statement about all this. This is all sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded. Is that just for culture? Like, you guys can get drunk, but the culture doesn't like it. They're to be dignified, self-controlled. Is that just for culture, to be dignified and self-controlled? That doesn't make sense. Sound in faith? I mean, the culture doesn't care if you have sound, you're sound in faith, but it, it will help your witness to the culture if you have sound faith. In love and in steadfastness. Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. Like, can older women be drunk or is that just for culture? They are to teach what is good and so train the young women to love their husbands and children. To be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. You can't just take this part of one sentence and pull it out of the rest. If young women being kind and workers at home, I talk, I talk about this other words, doesn't mean they're locked at home. It means they have responsibilities at home that they take care of. They, take, they, they, they treat their home well. They're pure. They're self-controlled. Loving their husbands. Like that's all so that the word of God may not be reviled. So basically here's the things that you'd have to say don't matter outside of culture. Being sober-minded, being dignified, being self-controlled, being sound in faith, love and steadfastness, being reverent, not being a slanderer, not being a drunk, loving your husband and child, children, working at home or not being lazy in other words, being kind, being submissive to your husbands. Then young men are told to be self-controlled then Titus, check this out, um, is to show himself in all respects to be a model of good works and in your teaching show integrity and dignity and sound speech, sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent 
may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Again, another phrase about how outside people in the culture view Christians. Here's the point in, in case I've lost anybody on, along the way. Paul lists a bunch of godly behaviors and he says, I don't want anyone outside the faith to be able to condemn us. I don't want the word of God being reviled. But that doesn't mean these behaviors aren't inherently godly. And if you're going to pick one, submit to husbands and say, that's just cultural. Then how is it that you res restore like dignity? Like, or integrity in his teaching. I mean, it's not like the outside world cares that I have good teaching as a Christian, but I'm going to have good teaching, right? So that the, they'll be put to shame simply by the truthfulness of everything I'm saying, whether they recognize it or not. So anyway, I think that's a real significant challenge to that view. Some might say that the only one with the qualifier is submissive to husbands, but that's not true either because when you read on the instructions to Titus himself are also for the same purpose, that the word of God won't be reviled, so that an opponent will be put to shame having nothing evil to say against us, verse 8. The whole passage is about that. So either the whole passage is going to be transcultural or the whole passage is going to be not transcultural or you're going to have to say, throw your hands up and say, I guess we just have to not chase this argument any further because it doesn't, doesn't bear any fruit. My point is this. Um, just because, and then we'll do the slavery objection. Uh, just because Paul cares about how our behavior witnesses to the world, it does not follow that this behavior is only expected of the Christian if the world around you expects it. Rather, Paul, the apostles, Jesus, they want us to have generally godly behavior to be a witness, and he encourages things that are transcultural, it seems, in all cases. The slavery objection. Okay, this is it. What about the slavery objection? Um, this is the last <clears throat> section, I think, <laughs> for today. It hurts. It hurts. It's so long. I want to go to bed. You want to go to bed. You might be in bed, actually. You actually could just be laying in bed while I do all this stuff. So, um... All right, just a drink of water and, and, then, and then I'm on it. Okay, the slavery objection. What is the slavery objection? Um, what follows no, mostly our notes I've taken in response to Craig Keener's section, chapter six on Paul, women and wives, where he deals with this. And his argument goes in two steps. Step one, you have to say that your view of marriage is interconnected with your view of slavery. You have to establish that if you apply wifely submission is a general rule across all cultures, then you also have to endorse slavery across all cultures. That's only step one, but let's talk about step one. Modern writers, Craig Keener writes, modern writers who argue that Paul's charge to wives to submit to their husbands as to Christ is binding in all cultures must come to grips with the fact that Paul even more plainly tell slaves to obey their masters as they would Christ. If one is binding in all cultures, so is the other. Next quote. To interpret the whole passage consistently, therefore, we must insist that what we grant today concerning slaves, that Paul's call to submit is not a transcultural approval of the master's authority, we must grant concerning wives that a call to submit is not a transcultural approval of the husband's authority. Those are the standards. Now, I agree with one thing. And this is what I agree with. And this is a big if. The only thing that wasn't established in there yet, we'll talk about this in a second, is if the justifications the Bible gives for why a wife submits and why a slave obeys, if those reasons are the same, then you would have to apply the rules exactly the same across all cultures. This is simple, right? Like if I stop at red lights and I go at green lights for the same reasons, say wife submitting is stopping at red lights and slaves obeying is going at green lights. But if I'm doing it for the same reasons, right? I, I, red light stop, it's the law. It's safe for me. It protects others. So I stop at red lights. Green light go, why? It's the law. It's safe for me. It protects others. So I go at green lights. If the reasons are the same, then you have to do both. You have to stop at red and go at green or you're being inconsistent. So if the reasons are the same, then you're right. The slavery objection works. And then step two, this is important, establish that neither is binding in all cultures, right? The conclusion that egalitarians have is not, therefore, 
slavery for everyone. Like, that's not their conclusion. Their conclusion is, therefore, neither for anyone. Right? Slavery is not binding in all cultures. Neither is a husband's role with a higher authority than his wife. They're not binding. Otherwise, um, egalitarians are not making the point they want to make. They're actually arguing for slavery <laughs> when they do this. Um, but step one, and, and this is where very little work is done. Usually they, they just rely on your natural revulsion to slavery and they go, therefore, you have to revolt against the idea of a wife submitting to her husband. Um, and they usually will treat it as an immoral and evil thing more often than not. Not always, not always, but more often than not, I usually see that. So step one is where all the work is really going to be done since they just assume number two. Step one, how does Craig Keener establish that the two, husbands and wives and slaves and masters, are so connected that your view of one has to be your view of the other? Well, he's going to primarily give two reasons. One, reason number one, ancient household codes taught that slaves' obedience was required for the same reasons as wife's obedience was required or her submission was required. This is not Paul we're talking about. This is like, Aristotle or somebody else, right? Plutarch or, or whoever. These are these ancient writers, Plato. They believed that the reason a wife submitted was the same reason a slave submitted, that the role differences were for the same reasons, right? Red light, green light issue. The second thing, that would only establish the culture though, even if we could establish that as true. The second reason Keener gives for why um, these two are perfectly interconnected is he says the New Testament, the New Testament also says that slave's obedience is required for the same reasons as a wife's obedience. This made my eyebrows go up. Actually, all the way back to here, I lost hair because my eyebrows just went up so fast so far. They, that, that the New Testament Bible, the Bible says a slave obeys for the same reason a wife does. We'll talk about both of those reasons now. So first, let's go to a quote from Dr. Keener. My beloved brother in Christ, who I feel bad about disagreeing with you so much here on these issues, and um, and Dr. Keener, if you want to talk to me, you're like, I will make time. We can chat. Um, I'm not offering to do a, a thousand videos with everybody I disagree with, but, but I'm just saying, as a brother, privately, me and you, we can talk. Um, here it says, the arguments for, subor for the subordination of each were roughly the same in ancient household codes. And a brief examination of the relevant New Testament passages will show that they're roughly the same there as well. Now, I spend a lot of time on this because a lot of times egalitarian writers will talk about household codes, but they'll never quote household codes. You'll notice I haven't quoted many household codes. Most of them don't. Um, and so you end up kind of in that, in that fog where a scholar just goes into the fog and he comes out with conclusions and he goes, household codes, trust me, you know. So on this, I had to dig a bit deeper. Are ancient household codes linking the idea that slavery and and uh, marriage have un imbalanced authority based on the same principles. Dr. Keener gives one particular source. The only source he gives is from Aristotle's Politics. I'm going to put it on your screen for you. It's going to be a wall of text that you probably can't read <laughs> unless you're on a computer and you make it real big um, or something that has a good screen. This is the, I've, I've, I've emboldened a few parts that are important. I'm not going to read this whole text to you. It's going to take too long, especially at this point in the video. If, if we're here 27 hours in so far. So here's the conclusions from, from this text that Keener gives. Here's the evidence that ancient household codes held that the reason wives submitted was the same as the reason slaves did. This is, this is, this is the only ancient source given. And here's the analysis of it. Aristotle says that the male is by nature superior and the female is by nature inferior. That's Aristotle's claim. It's not my claim. Um, he also says, th and, and, that, and that, that's, by the way, that's the only reason he gives in this passage. This whole long passage, he never gives any other reasons for why a woman would submit or a wife would submit to her husband. He just says, men are by nature superior, females inferior. Then he talks a lot about slaves. He says, slaves ought to be ruled by those who have greater reason. He doesn't use the superior, inferior exactly language, but he says those who have greater reason. This is because some men, according to Aristotle, some men have the soul of a servant. He also thinks that this is independent of their bodies. This is not race-based slavery. This is him looking around going, that guy has the soul of a servant, whether he is one or not. That guy has the soul of a master, even though he's a servant. How unfortunate that he was born into the body of a servant, but his soul is that of a leader, of a master. 
So this is independent from their body since they may have the body of a free man, according to Aristotle, without the corresponding soul of a free man <laughs> or the body of a slave without the soul of a slave. They might have the soul of a free man. It's not clear that Aristotle thinks this is true of women. He just doesn't talk about it in this passage. So this passage seems like a strange proof text, even though it's quite long. Um, it's clear that the reason slaves, according to Aristotle, should be in submission to masters is because of a lower capacity for reason. The person who has the greater reason and the more control over his passions is best to be in charge of others because it's safer for the one who has less reason and less charge of his passions. But it is not clear that this is the reason why men have more authority than women. He just says they are by nature superior. So I was reading Aristotle, not something I do every week. Um, and I think that Craig, and, and looking up for some scholarly work on Aristotle, what was Aristotle's view of men and women, the souls of men and women, why were men and women? And I was digging into this and it came across the following quote. And I think that Dr. Keener may have misrepresented Aristotle on this issue. Aristotle, his only source that goes to quote, to show that men and women, slaves and masters, that their situations were based on the same principles. I don't think he thought that at all. Look at what he said when he actually talked about the issue here. And I have a link in my notes. In fact, I've typed out the link just so you guys can go look it up yourselves. You can actually type in that link exactly. You will, you will get to see this text. The free man rules over the slave after another manner from that in which the man rules over the female or the man over the child. Aristotle thinks apparently these things are different. Although the parts of the soul are present in all of them, they are present in different degrees. For the slave has no deliberative function, uh, faculty at all. The woman has. The woman does have this. But it is without authority. And the child has, but it is immature. He sees the child in a temporary situation of immature authority or immature reasoning. He sees as the slave, again, the slave doesn't even mean someone who is actually a slave, but the person who has that soul of someone who should be serving others. These are Aristotle's views, not mine, guys. But just to be clear on them, he thinks that person is sort of permanently a fool. Like they're permanently not good at thinking and they're not good at controlling their passions. But he thinks with a woman, it's totally different. The woman, she has these deliberative faculties, but she doesn't have authority. Here's my conclusions. The reasoning offered in Dr. Keener's only example, Aristotle, refutes his point. Aristotle thought that the slave had a different capacity for reason, but that the woman was different. She could have had all the capacity for reason in the world, but didn't have authority in her, in her relationship with, this, with her husband. Further, the slave soul was independent of being born into the body of someone who would end up being a slave, but that doesn't seem true with, with the person who's a woman. So Aristotle thinks that your, 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 your slave souls, you should be a slave status or you should be master status, was independent of your body, not race-based, nothing else. But he does think it's gender-based when it comes to women. So it's different on all accounts. That's just ancient culture. That's not even the Bible. We haven't got to the New Testament yet. Everything hinges on the next issue. The second claim and final claim to address in the video is that Dr. Keener says the New Testament bases a slave's relationship with his master on the same principles as a wife's relationship with her husband being one of a different authority. Sadly, in the entire book, even though the slavery objection is massive, and I hear it from egalitarian scholars everywhere, he never explains this. He never offers any justifications that the New Testament teaches that these are based on the same principles. There's only one resource that Dr. Keener gives, and it's a, a, a book by Kevin Giles that's out of print. I tried to get a hold of it. I couldn't even find it used. I couldn't find it anywhere. So I read another book from Kevin Giles, and um, and it, it wasn't there. The, the data was not there either. So I don't have access to whatever data is being used, but I have access to the Bible, and so do you. Do you think that the Bible says that a wife submitting to her husband is based on the same principles and reasons of a master-slave relationship? Because if you don't, then ancient culture didn't, and the New Testament didn't, and the slavery objection completely fails, completely fails, and becomes a horrible, horrible slander against biblical marriage, which is, I, I think, what it truly is. So the New Testament, does it give the same things? Um, let's look at some details here. What are the biblical justifications for women submitting, and then what are the biblical justifications and reasons for a slave obeying? This is important 
this is an issue we need to we need to be what Aristotle called the master here and have control of our thinking and our passions and work through this. <laughs> I feel like some people are totally on the page with me. Yeah, Mike, let's just talk it through. And others are like <laughs> freaking out. So uh, if you're freaking out, I don't know, maybe maybe my channel is not for you. Um, I, I don't I don't pad things as well as some people do in some cases. So neither does the Bible. <laughs> so women should submit in the Bible because of the following reasons. And I will share with you scriptures as well. I may as well put them on the screen for you as I run through them. So Ephesians 5.23, we went over today and we've gone over this before. It's also in 1 Corinthians 11.3 and it is that a husband is the head of his wife. That is the natural, here's 1 Corinthians 11.3, natural relationship of a husband and a wife. He's the head of the wife. Right? That's number one. Is that set of slaves? No. Uh, number two, we'll go over this verse in more detail in the future in this series. 1 Corinthians 14, 34. Okay, the silence is not complete. I'll talk all about that later. But the point here is the law also says a woman should be in submission. So the belief here is that, in, and I, I take it that law here means Old Testament. He's like, the law, that Old Testament stuff, it's been saying this all along. And if you look at the first half of my series, we're dealing with Old Testament stuff all through, and it is pretty consistent. So the Old Testament says so. The next verse I'll point out is 1 Timothy 2.13, and we will cover this in great detail in the future. This is one of the most knockdown passages for the uh, complementarian side, and I haven't even addressed it yet. Um, Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Gresser. What is this all about? Um, a woman's general submission, and I'll deal with this in detail. Forgive me, you guys, for not doing it right now. Why? Because of creation. That's the bottom line here. Creation and, of course, the falls mixed in there. We'll deal with this in great detail later. But consistently, in Ephesians um, and in Timothy, we have it dealing with creation and the fall. And then number five... Um, which is Titus 2, 5, that the word of God may not be reviled. Submit to your own husbands that the word of God may not be reviled. Now, some would, again, take this, oh, well, that means it's just for culture. And I think I showed that that's not the case. It could be for culture, but it's obviously not because he has a list of a bunch of things there that are not just for culture. So you can't take that phrase as meaning that. So consider all the things that would just be cultural, right? Not stealing, not having good Christian doctrine, self-control, not being drunk, having good works, having integrity. Oh, that's all just cultural. Like a Christian has the only policy we have is try to pretend we're good um, by the through the eyes of culture. So we have um, women's women submit to the husbands because the husband's the head of the wife. The law says Adam was made first. Eve was deceived. And Adam was not. The word of God shouldn't be reviled. Those are reasons why in the New Testament should slaves obey their masters. This is this is interesting. There's very little information on this. It seems to me that in the New Testament, one of the main reasons a slave should obey their master is because you're a slave. That is, it's cultural, <laughs> right? Slavery is not grounded in creation. No, all mankind comes from Adam and Eve. We're all of one blood. Slavery is not grounded in, in, in race or somebody be born into something they're supposed to stay into. That's not a principle or rule of any kind. It doesn't have any of the same qualifications as, as marriage. It's just you're in the situation where you're a slave, so you're finding yourself as a slave, then do so unto Christ. That's the reason. Slaves should obey because they're slaves. Like you're in that situation. That seems to be a, a good case for a cultural thing. Um, in everything they might, uh, Titus 2, 9 and 10, same passage we were dealing with earlier, says that they might adorn the doctrine of our God and Savior. That by doing all these things, we're adorning the doctrine of our God and Savior. That doesn't make it cultural only. It does mean that it has an impact on the uh, on, on, on the gospel reaching people. And so we do care about the impact. That doesn't mean it's not transcultural. That doesn't mean it is transcultural. You just can't draw anything from that other than it has an impact on our witness, which is good. Um, and that's the same thing I'm saying about the other stuff in First Timothy, uh, in Titus 2. So slaves... There's very little info in the New Testament about why somebody should be a slave. They're told how to behave, but they're never given a reason for why they ought to be slaves in the first place. 
I'll read it to you. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. This is the verses that Dr. Keener says is for the same reasons as a husband submits to his wife. I don't understand this, but... Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. That's how they do it, not why they do it. How? As you would Christ. Not by the not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with goodwill as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or is free. Then it threatens masters. <laughs> Stop your threatening, knowing that he who's their master and yours is in heaven and there's no partiality with him. Sort of threatens the threateners, you know? Um, but now let me let me focus on this because what I what will help us more, sorry, I didn't have that on your screen there, is the differences between slaves and wives. Okay, here are major differences between these things. Slaves, unlike wives, imagine if this was said of a wife are told to get free if they can. Were you called a bond servant when called? Don't be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. Hey, if it works out and you can get free, go for it. If not, don't worry about it. You're, you could still serve Christ in that role. In other words, it's not great, guys. We're not excited about it. We're not, it's not, oh, slavery is a great thing. It's, just, it's God ordained. No, marriage is, but not slavery. If you can get out, get out. But if not, you're honoring Christ in the middle of it. Imagine if you told wives, are you married? Don't worry about it. But if you can get out of it, try to get out of it, please. <laughs> Slavery is obviously very different in the New Testament. I feel like it's almost slandering to the word of God to say that they're based on the same thing. Don't become slaves, also scripture says, if you can help it. Same passage, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 23, two verses down. You were bought with a price. Do not become bond servants of men. Hey, if you're already a slave and you can get out, go for it. If you're not, if you can't, just serve the Lord well with where you're at. God's going to honor and bless you. God's going to reward you. But don't become a slave if you can avoid it. Why? Because slavery is considered a bad scenario in Scripture, just like it's a bad scenario in anybody's reasonable mind. And, and in addition to that, marriage is not considered this. Since when is it? Do not become hus you know, wives of husbands? Where does it say that in Scripture? Obviously, these are not based on the same principles. God continually sees slavery throughout the Old Testament as a bad situation to be avoided. Um, even Old and New Testaments, right? Exodus, the idea is that they were enslaved and they're brought out and they're, that he doesn't want them to be enslaved. He wants his people to be free and he wants all to be free. And Jesus comes to set the captives free and all this never does he say he's come to separate the marriages of everybody that he wants to he wants to encourage divorce and marriage is this in other words marriage wonderful slavery unfortunate but you can still serve god there so the instructions to husbands and wives involve these tying it to creation and tying it to the nature of christ in the church and the instructions to slaves is like hey you know you're going you're gonna to serve, the, serve as unto the Lord and honor him and your reward will be great. And masters, don't you threaten your slaves because God is going to deal with you one day. These are obviously very different things. Gender differences are grounded in creation. Slavery is grounded in circumstances. Poverty, oppression, prisoners of war. Slavery is an unfortunate condition, whereas marriage is a God-ordained relationship. There are parallels and differences between wives and slaves, right? Wives are a natural part of the home. Slaves are not. Wives are called to submit differently than slaves. Slaves follow all orders, right? This is different. Wives are not one with, or excuse me, wives are one with their husband, head body relationship, right? As Christ in the church. Slaves are not one with their masters. There's none of that going on. Wives' roles are due to God's created order. Slaves' roles are purely situational. Wives' roles are considered desirable and good and part of the way God intends it. Slaves are like unfortunate situation. God can use you if you can get free. Go get free. Don't become a slave if you can help it. All these things. They're not parallel. The only connection between the wife, slave, child in Ephesians is they all submit in one sense or another. That's why Paul says submit to one another and he's like, wives submit your husbands, children obey your parents, slaves obey your masters. Because there's a submission element in all those relationships. It's not the same submission, but it's there in all relationships. That's the parallel. Um, the better parallel in Ephesians is not wives and slaves, but wives and children. I would argue that if you're going to say wives don't have to submit to their parent, their husbands, and this is not transcultural, then why do children have to obey their parents? And some even try to say this kind of in a way, and I think it's... Uh, read Proverbs. 
And what it says about those who abandon the responsibility to discipline their children. It says you, you hate your child. It's not, not good. This is not me saying that wives are like children either. No, wives aren't children. They're not permanent children. They're not permanent minors. As some egalitarians ac accuse complementarians of saying, I say that's just slander against us and you should just go away. Is there, however, and I'm so close to being done and I'm just going to, I'm going to go play a Batman video game. Um, is there an internal contradiction in the egalitarian interpretations of Ephesians 5? Because I don't know for sure what egalitarians are trying to say sometimes. Sometimes they say it's mutual submission um, and therefore it's transcultural because it's mutual submission. Husbands and wives both submit to each other. Keener seems to say this. Other times they say it's not transcultural, right? It is an imbalanced authority, husband and wife, but it's not for all cultures. Just like slavery is not something we would encourage in all cultures. And I'm like, <laughs> these two things cannot be true at the same time. And maybe Keener's way of balancing that is by saying, well, you know, the Christians knew mutual submission is what Paul meant, but the Romans thought he was saying imbalanced authority, and that's that's not transcultural yet. The mutual thing is trans. And here I go, there's a simpler view, and I think I'll go with that one. All right, here's my conclusions, and then I'm done. Yes, in Scripture, consistently, over and over, it does teach that wives submit to their husbands. That is not oppression because husbands have a self-sacrificial love to their wives that is meant to imitate Jesus and his incredible self-killing love for the church. That is not oppressive. Submission doesn't mean micromanagement. Submission doesn't mean she has no authority of any kind. Submission doesn't mean she's a permanent minor. Submission doesn't mean she has no personal pursuits or she can't control her own business or something like that. Submission doesn't mean those things. We're to see them as uh, our co-heirs in Christ, husbands, you're to honor them, lest your prayers be hindered under threat of your relationship with God being damaged, you honor her. This is right order in marriage, but without abuse. I think that's the biblical view. Complementarians are trying to say, this is what egalitarians will frequently do, is they'll take the orders to wives, and they'll treat them apart from all the other stuff, like husband's rules and the limits and things like that, and then they make it look like this monster, and I don't think that's the truth. The Bible's remarkably consistent here. You didn't even need my Bible study. I mean, did I even teach you anything today that you didn't know from just reading the verses yourself? I don't think so. I really just handled the debates to bring us back to, like, in this case, it's plain enough that you and your Bible would have given you clarity on these issues if you just simply read it and simply paid attention to it. And probably only when somebody came around with some wild alternate views about ancient household codes you'd never heard as you start considering other things. This has been interesting. Guess what I'm doing next time? Head coverings. Um, I need some time to prepare this. You guys, this has been one of my most requested videos. It's one of the least important, but most requested videos I've done in this series, um, which is head coverings. Are they required today? What is First Corinthians saying about women and head coverings and all this kind of stuff? And I have a lot of work to do still ahead of because when I look at this, the landscape of literature that I've read from egalitarians, complementarians, they say totally contradictory things, not just about the Bible, but about ancient history, about ancient Rome and what head coverings were like. And did they even use head coverings? Was the hair up or was it just covered with something? Was it only covered in certain circumstances? What, it, what was the messaging and meaning of that covering? Um, there is such confusion at such a high level that what I need to do is continue my research by looking for more... Um, Sources of scholars who just specialize in ancient Rome and don't even worry about all these egalitarian, complementarian things. So that's going to take some time to dig into. Thanks, guys, for joining. For those who came, it was it was brutal. I mean, for me, it was brutal. I was just tired. Just preparing this was like so much. My life is so hard. Oh, poor me. No, my life is a wonderful, wonderful life. But I am going to go play a Batman video game. So uh, let me pray. Um, Lord, we, we thank you for... The order you give us in marriage. I just pray that you'd help your church to see that it's good. And when we shine the goodness of that order in marriage, may the world see that it's good too. May it adorn the doctrine of Christ. May it, may it cause others to, to see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. We pray that you would help husbands to take seriously their call to love their wives so sacrificially at all times. Not control, but love. 
that that's the focus and that wives would see that their their call is is submission that there is a, a yielding that happens there and it doesn't devalue them it's it's a way in which they serve their their lord and savior in jesus name amen